give you some enemies that suggest that you will take down. <laughs> in the first series of the lobby, Al Jazeera's investigative unit exposed the role of pro-Israel operatives in Britain. The headlines at 11 o'clock. Israel's ambassador to the UK has apologised after a senior diplomat was caught on camera saying he wanted to take down the Foreign Office Minister, Sir Alan Duncan. Sir Alan Duncan, who's a strong critic of Jewish settlements. An undercover reporter for Al Jazeera doing an investigation into Britain's relationship with Israel. This investigation exposes a covert Israeli campaign to influence British policy. The investigation led to the resignation of Shai Massot, a senior political officer at the Israeli embassy. Mr. Massot is also heard describing the Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson as an idiot. The diplomat in question uh, no longer seems to be a functionary of the embassy in London. Uh, and so whatever, whatever he may exactly have been doing here, his cover can uh, be said to have been well and truly blown. At the same time, Al Jazeera had been running a second undercover operation. Some of our reporters covert filming was included in the first series of the lobby. His identity became known. Tony had spent five months inside the pro-Israel lobby in the United States. He'd impressed colleagues with his understanding of the Middle East. You have the resourcefulness and the depth you know, to sort of think strategically about this, whereas most people aren't able to do that. A prominent Jewish online magazine described Tony as the perfect gentleman who became one of the town's best-liked Zionist activists. You did amazing work here. The guys don't stop talking about you. They still talk about you. Tony threw elaborate parties. And apparently anyone interested in telling a story about sinister Israeli influence in America's capital couldn't have asked for a better guest list. In the new edition of The Lobby, we investigate the role of pro-Israel advocacy groups in this country in the first of a four-part series, how The Lobby is being drawn into Israel's covert campaign to spy on American citizens. Using an undercover reporter, Al Jazeera's investigative unit infiltrates one of the most powerful lobbies in the world. Getting $38 billion in security aid to Israel matters, which is what APAC is doing. We examine how the lobby led by APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, has secured unwavering support in Congress. Congressmen don't do anything unless you pressure them. And the only way to do that is with money. What the lobby is all about is to make sure that Israel gets special treatment from the United States forever. But after occupying Palestinian lands for half a century, the pro-Israel lobby is facing a new challenge. We called for a full boycott of Israel, divesting from it, and eventually imposing sanctions on it to achieve UN stipulated rights of the Palestinian people. A movement to boycott, divest, and impose sanctions on Israel, BDS, was formed on American campuses. Seems to be achieving its goals threatens future American support for Israel. We believe in justice for all people. So that means the occupation has to end. Israel's Ministry of Strategic Affairs responded with a covert operation to defeat BDS. So the Israeli government leverages Jewish organizations yes. in the diaspora. Absolutely. It's a psychological campaign involving spying and smears. You discredit the messenger as a way of discrediting the message. Just stay on message. And what is that message? BDS is a paid movement. While our reporter monitored pro-Israel groups, he was asked to go undercover for the lobby. You're going into enemy territory, not for everybody. We are a different government working on foreign soil and we have to be very, very cautious. We have three different sub-campaigns which are very, very sensitive. 
regarding data gathering, information analysis, working on activist organization, money trail. This is something that only a country with its resources can do the best. If you want to win, we have to change our ways. We have to think differently. And this is waging a holistic campaign against the other side. Take him out of his comfort zone. Make him be on the defensive. Israel is involved in a secretive influence campaign whose aim is to discredit its challenges in the West. In the Air Force, when you want to win, you have to have aerial superiority. If you want to win a campaign, you must have information superiority. And this is exactly the added value Israel capabilities, technological and otherwise, we can bring to the game, and we are working on that very hard. In the United States, the lobby is working with Israel to spy on American citizens. We're giving them uh, data, for example, one day Sima's deputy is sending me a photo, just a photo in WhatsApp, so you can boycott Israel on a billboard. In a few hours, our systems and analysts could find the exact organization, people, and even their names where they live. We gave it back to the ministry. I have no idea what they did with this. But in fact, three days later, there were no billboards. We use all sorts of technology. We use corporate level, enterprise grade, and social media intelligence software. Almost all of this happens on social media. So we have custom algorithms and formulae that acquire the stuff immediately. In terms of like, Information sharing. We, we did add the Ministry of Strategic Affairs to our operations and, and intelligence brief, which kind of goes back to how do we get information about what's going on in American college campuses. Generally, within about 30 seconds or less of one of these things popping up on campus, whether it's a Facebook event, whether it's the right kind of mention on Twitter, the system picks it up, it goes into a queue and alerts our researchers, and they evaluate it, they tag it. And if it rises to a certain level, we issue early warning alerts to our partners. They operate through subterfuge, and they walk a very thin line between the legal and illegal in what they do in order to gather information and to smear their opponents and just ultimately destroy them. In order to understand how the pro-Israel lobby operates, you have to literally be a fly on the wall. If you can't obtain information publicly, you should try to get into the room through other means. Our undercover reporter, Tony, is British and Jewish and had recently graduated from the University of Oxford. He wrote articles and presented himself as a strong supporter of Israel. In Washington, he attended a course on the Israel-Palestine conflict. I'm from the UK, and I, I'm just taking a course at Georgetown here over the summer. He networked in the social circles of the pro-Israel lobby. Hi, I'm Rona. I'm Tony. Nice to meet you. Nice to see you. I'm good. Oh, good to see you. Hey. After building his profile, Tony was accepted on a training course in pro-Israel advocacy. Welcome to Feel for Truth DC's second boot camp. Congratulations, everyone, to being accepted. What we're going to do right now is uh, just kind of like introduce ourselves. I'm Daniel. After undergrad, I served in the IDF and the paratroopers for two years and worked at APAC for a year. One session criticized the UN agency that provides aid for Palestinians. Children are taught in UNRWA Palestinian schools to hate Jews. Another lecture dealt with the international media. Confronting media bias. During the last war, a lot of times videos are circulating uh, of you know, of bombed areas or victims, and a lot of it's from Syria, from Iraq 10 years ago, all this stuff. In role play workshops, they were instructed how to respond to criticism of Israel. Can I have a volunteer? The apartheid walls cutting off Palestine, boycott Israel, divest from Israel, sanction uh, companies that do business with Israel. 
it's kind of oddly called a wall, given that like 90% of it is a fence. This is a photo, I see a wall. Why can't Israel do more to help Tony? Our undercover reporter played the role of pro-Israel advocate. Israel is doing a lot to help the Palestinians. They say actually Israel is doing all the best that they can, but you know, it's a tough situation. The people, businesses in Gaza can't, can't freely send their trucks into Israel to sell their goods. I think you'll find that that's actually a misconception. They do allow their trucks, and what they don't allow is, is dangerous material. Okay, stop. After the course, Tony was accepted as a volunteer at a pro-Israel communications group called the Israel Project. It's a Tony Kleinfeld. Uh, Kleinfeld. Kleinfeld. Like Seinfeld, but with a K. <laughs> the Israel Project, known as TIP, describes itself on its promotional videos as a strategic communications group. At TIP, we believe we've found the answer. Israel's enemies have left the battlefield of the Middle East and are now fighting on the battlefield of public opinion. What you have with regard to the United States and Israel is a special relationship that is unprecedented in recorded history. Not simply that the United States gives Israel a tremendous amount of economic aid and diplomatic protection. It gives that aid and protection uh, no matter what, right? It's not conditional and the Israel Project will go to enormous lengths to achieve that end. During his placement as a volunteer, Tony took notes on what he saw and heard in Tip's offices. He worked in what they called the war room, where media and communications are monitored. Staff described having contacts at numerous media organizations. Their primary means of influence is by forging friendships with reporters. One employee claimed that during talks on the nuclear deal with Iran, Tip applied pressure on the Associated Press news agency to change a headline. Tony read the Israel Project's annual report, which described Tip's mission as building an echo chamber for pro-Israel information. That means using the media to amplify and repeat Tip's messages, as well as what the report describes as neutralizing undesired narratives. Tony saw one document which claimed that the echo chamber was within their grasp. Weeks before he started, Tony discussed with a senior manager how Tip deals with the media. You know, you You can get a lot more done by making questions get asked by journalists. And if you create it from multiple directions at the same time through multiple journalists, then you need to create a kind of sense of crisis. We develop relationships a lot about them, a lot to get them to trust us. The uh, basic message is on the following BDS is essentially a kind of a hate group targeting Israel. They're anti-peace. We try not to even use the term just because it, it builds their brand. We just refer to boycotters. The goal is to actually make things happen now and to figure out what are the means of communication to do that. In 2005, Palestinian civil rights groups sought a peaceful means to protest against Israel's occupation. They identified goods from Israel and called for their boycott. The BDS movement was born. BDS adopted a nonviolent strategy because we think it is morally consistent and very effective against an enemy that is extremely powerful militarily. We called for boycotting Israel, divesting from it, and eventually imposing sanctions on it, as was done against apartheid South Africa to achieve basic Palestinian rights under international law. Over the past decade, BDS has grown around the world. By campaigning for Palestinian civil rights in land controlled by Israel, 
BDS believes it has exposed a deficiency in the moral defense of the Jewish state. BDS is saying that what Israel has to do is treat the Palestinians in its midst the same way it treats Israeli Jews. The problem is that if Israel does that, there are more Palestinians, or there will be more Palestinians inside greater Israel than there are Jews. And that means that if you had a system where everybody was treated equally and there was one person and one vote, that you would no longer have a Jewish state. The secretive Ministry of Strategic Affairs based in the Prime Minister's office in Jerusalem, was given a mission, establish a covert campaign to defeat the BDS movement. אז אני אגיד לך שכשאם אתה רוצה לנצח בניהול מערכה, אתה צריך לעשות את זה עם הרבה מאוד עמימות. כמו שכשעבדתי על סוגיות צבאיות, כמו חיזבאללה, או כספי טרור, או סוריה, או כל מדינה אחרת שאיתה בעבר, ניהלתי מערכה מולה כקמן. לא הלכנו ואמרנו לצד השני מה אנחנו מתכוונים לעשות. השארנו אותו בעמימות. Government ministers attacked me in person, one of them threatening BDS leaders with targeted civil assassination, and others threatening to revoke my permanent residency, along other threats. No BDS, <laughs> תפקידנו, באמצעות הפעלת המודיעין, לחשוף את הקשרים האלה, ובהחלט באמצעות החשיפה הזאת, גם לדעת לפעול נגדם, לבודד אותם, גם להעביר מידע לאותם גורמים מודיעיניים בעולם וגורמים אחרים. ישראל חייבת לבצע סיכול אזרחי ממוקד במנהיגות למול פעילי ה-BDS. The campaign includes monitoring the activities of American students. We are now, for example, in a process of creating a whole image of the campus. If you want to succeed, you have to know that you will be able to 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 be able. Our investigation into the role of the Israeli state at U.S. campuses led Tony to an employee at the embassy in Washington. She's American, and her job is to analyze BDS activity for the Israeli government. So, like, nobody really knows what we're doing. Um, but mainly it's been a lot of, like, research, like, monitoring BDS things and reporting it back to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and, like, making sure everyone knows what's going on. They need a lot of research done and stuff like that. When they talk about it in Knesset, like, usually I've, heard, like, contributed to what the background information is. I'm not going to campuses. It's more about connecting organizations and, I guess, campuses and providing, like, resources and strategy if students need it. Is the Israeli embassy trying to leverage faculty? Or? Yeah. Um, we're working with several faculty like advocacy groups that kind of train faculty, so we're like helping them a little bit with like funding, connections, bringing them to speak, having them speak to diplomats and people in the MFA that need this information. So I kind of want to be that resource to show students like we appreciate what you're doing, you see what we're, you're doing. Here's some information if you need anything at all. We can connect to you, just kind of be that person there for you. Julia was president of the pro-Israel group at Davis, which is part of the University of California. Davis began as a center for agricultural studies, and its students are known as Aggies. I came to UC Davis, which had a reputation of being like a really pro-Israel. Now it's like the top five most anti-Israel schools in the US. Why is that? Because of everything that happened in the last few years. It was just particularly bad. Um, and there's a huge Muslim population in Sacramento, which is right next to Davis. The growing support for the BDS movement in Davis and the lobby's response to it is part of a narrative that's unfolding across America's campuses. Students for Justice in Palestine, or SJP, 
brought a divestment motion before the student senate. I was very, very nervous. The entire room was filled. I think we had about 600 students and people from the community coming in to witness this vote. I am here today because quite frankly, I am ashamed. I am ashamed of my university for supporting apartheid as and of my people in Palestine. I ended the speech with something along the lines of being on the right side of history and for the university to end its unethical ties with these corporations who were doing uh, brutal things uh, to Palestinians. We knew they were going to win because our entire student senate was all pro BDS and like they ran for that purpose and won for that purpose and we've been pushed out of student government for months. Good evening. My name is Julia Rifkin, and I'm the president of Aggies for Israel. Students streamed the hearing online. The pro-Israel group also filmed it with another purpose in mind. Their videos would play a key part in the story that was to unfold in the days ahead. I was waiting to see what she would say. I was waiting for a blow to come my way, and that blow sure came. We have been ignored and disrespected year after year, but we have never been silenced. We are a beacon of peace and inclusion on a campus plagued by anti-Semitism. The talking points were that the resolution was anti-Semitic, um, that it was divisive. If it's divisive in the fact that you either support human rights or you don't, then so be it. The intolerance that spawned this resolution is the same kind of intolerance that has spawned anti-Semitic movements throughout history. The entire thing looked very rehearsed. Very, very aggressive, almost comically so. Julia and her pro-Israel allies had already decided that they didn't want to debate. At 4 a.m. the night before, me and my team were like, you're going to leave the walkout. And I was like, OK. Um, and they're like, we're going to film it just for our own purposes. And I was like, totally cool. So when everything was happening, like we went into it knowing we were going to lose. So our strategy was how to like ultimately win while losing the vote. This is our victory. And we who are victorious need not legitimize the words spoken in this empty hearing. So if you are here tonight in opposition to this resolution, I invite you now to stand up, really stand up, and join me in walking out of the room. That was a wowing moment. To have them just stand up, everyone just and it was like, what, what's going on? It was very shocking. As they were leaving, it was just a very big rush of relief to not have that tension, those bad vibes in the room. Um, and so we started cheering, actually, and it was a great moment. If you're standing in the back, it looks like some seats have opened up. <laughs> but the passing of the BDS motion proved to be just the beginning of a bigger story. In part two, how the lobby worked to undermine the student decision. Those swastikas, who did them? We don't even know. Hey, Julia. 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 Our undercover reporter was meeting an employee of the Israeli embassy in Washington. She had led a pro-Israel group while at university in California. So if you are here tonight, in all positions, Resolution. Students at Davis were about to vote in favor of a divestment motion. During the debate, the pro-Israel group staged a walkout. They uploaded videos to publicize their protest. Our thought was to control the narratives. By having the speech, like, we wanted it to cause attention. We wanted everyone to see us walking out to show that like, this doesn't represent us or we're good about this. Um, so that's how we kind of formulated it. That day, all of us released like 50 op-eds and major news sources so that when people made a hashtag and like a whole thing trending, so when people opened their Facebooks, it wouldn't be them celebrating their victory, it'd be us sharing our stories. Once it blew up, then random people, like the Huffington Post contacted me and was like, do you have anything to say? And I was like, conveniently, I wrote an op-ed two weeks ago just in case. involved in anything like their entire newsfeed was Israel stuff and like that was what we wanted because that's how we got the word out there. 
How do you delegitimize the other side? Delegitimizing them. Um, kind of through that, that lens of taking over and like making them sound crazy at their game. A student senator who's Muslim made a Facebook status saying like Israel will fall, or Sharia law is taking over Davis, like we will come off, like that kind of status. So that happened. We had been called terrorists and told that we were Hamas sympathizers, that we want to bring Sharia law to campus and things like that. Hi, everyone. My name is Azka Azka Fayaz. I'm a second year political science major. Azka Fayaz was a committed BDS activist and claims that pro Israel students repeatedly tried to link her to political violence. They just came up to me and said, You're a terrorist. Are you a terrorist? You're going to bring, you know, terrorism <laughs> to the student government. Um, and things of that nature. And vote smart. I know her. It was ironic. She was directly making a joke of that. When I saw it, though, given the climate at the time, I did grow concern. People who were involved, you know, they were like, hey, there's actually uh, a lot of negative postings on social media. They're sharing your picture and the cover photo with your caption. It's turning really ugly. That caption was reposted and retweeted over and over and over again. I knew that something big was sort of going to happen. Pro-Israel students were taunted by pro-Hamas students after an anti-Israel vote passed on campus. Listen and watch. Right after the vote passed, a student senator posted this on Facebook. Hamas and Sharia law have taken over UC Davis BRB crying over the resilience. I don't have the capacity to bring Sharia law to the University of California Davis. Um, I don't think any, <laughs> any of us really do have the capacity. They wanted to try to make me look as evil and violent as possible. How can we use their words out of context in such a way that their victory doesn't seem so victorious anymore? Conveniently, like, the Dead Messman video just happened to do that. Like, when they all started shouting all the walk far as we were leaving, like, that was really nice for us in a way, because, like, we caught them um, just, you know, yeah. doing what they're doing. And then it, like, went viral on YouTube. Anger and tension running high at the University of California Davis campus. What you just saw played out late last week as the Student Government Association voted on a resolution to boycott the Jewish state of Israel. They kept showing it over and over again. And then they just said that the Muslim students forced the pro-Israel students to leave the room. Reports say when the Israel, Israel supporters tried to object to this vote, the pro-Palestinian students you just saw tried to shout them down with cries of Alu Akbar. I invite you now to stand up, really stand up, and join me in walking out Of course, we know that they left willingly and they stated that they were going to walk out of the room. It's incredible to, to hear Alu Akbar uh, yeah, shouted well, that, in the middle of this university, and what is that? And what does that represent, Megan? The subjugation of women, the torture of uh, homosexuals, uh, the, the torture of Christians, the crucifixion of Christians. That's what it has come to represent, and that's what they're shouting. The pro-BDS activists at UC Davis then faced another crisis. Two days after a resolution passed, unfortunately, someone defamed the Jewish frat house and um, had painted swastikas all over it. Outrageous, uh, just not acceptable behavior at all. What was upsetting to us, however, was they had the media there right away. Disturbing discovery for a UC Davis student. Uh, Jewish students found swastikas painted on their fraternity house in Davis. The swastikas were discovered that morning and around 10 a.m., my, my best guess, and I believe the news media were there by 11. Pro-Israel students say they feared recent events would lead to this. This week has been sort of a bad week to be Jewish on campus. After years of heated meetings, a student body passed a resolution Thursday urging UC Davis to end any affiliation with companies that support Israel. So this is not out of the blue. We're pretty sure this is directly related. 
who were they finger pointing at but us? Us who were still on this high of finally getting this resolution passed still in high spirits just crushed us. Roseanne Barr tweeted, all the Jews should leave Davis and the rest of the school should be nuked. It was a crazy time. A general flooding of Islamophobia by the media. And I was dealing with like news outlets and media and it was like the day after there was some swastikas on campus and it was like, it all blew up and what, became yeah. a full-time job. Those swastikas, like, who, who did them? We don't even know. I think it's just some, like, random, like, white supremacist-type people who just came, did it, left. We don't think it was students. That's pretty surprising because it was very clear from their behavior towards us, their attitudes towards us, that we had done some heinous crime to them and that we deserved to pay for it. Students who were part of the divestment movement painted swastikas on the fraternity. That's what she was hinting at. That's what she was trying to imply. Why would we act against our interests and, and do that at a moment when we were, I guess, victorious? The fact that it was just so quickly tossed onto us as those who had done this, it was damaging. It was hugely damaging. That was kind of our strategy. A lot of it was media-based, which is like kind of my interest in media. And I'd say that's like 99% of what it means to be successful. That happened. Then there was another swastika. It was just like every day something new was happening and I had to... It was weird because they won. Yeah. So you'd think if they would win, why would they do exactly. that? Exactly. Yeah, it's interesting. So, well, that was kind of our whole strategy is we knew they were going to win. Were you in touch with the embassy or were you in touch with like any uh, groups? Pretty much or? all of the groups. Um, not the embassy, I guess our consulate. As well as the Israeli consulate in San Francisco, Julia's anti-BDS campaign had the guidance of several pro-Israel lobby groups. Stan with us helped us a little bit in terms of actual research on the speech. They gave us some like legal research type stuff. Um, I'm always biased and want to work with APAC, so they kind of helped for like more support. Um, and David Project helped us a little bit. It was more help like gaining contact in like the media world. I guess we needed money to pay for somebody to film the speech. Like we had a Davis faculty for Israel group and like they were hugely helpful to us. They would, you know, because some of them were retired lawyers and they'd write legal documents for us. They knew the administration, they were tenured, they had pull. Despite the passing of the BDS motion, the governors of the university known as Regents are under no obligation to abide by the students' vote. As for that resolution to boycott Israel, well, UC Regents issued a statement saying they will not even entertain the idea. After looking back on everything, I feel a little creepy because of what happened after the vote. People that were affiliated with the group just were smeared and had to deal with this, these very personal crises of the world calling us terrorists and the world thinking that we were this spiteful hate group. It's pretty unequivocal how organized they were, how brutal and uh, ruthless that narrative was and how it affected us in the end. Back in Washington, our undercover reporter was attending the annual conference of the Israeli-American Council. The IAC's role is to connect American Jews to Israel. This year, combating BDS was top of the agenda. I think we need to worry. The polling isn't good. And all of you probably know it. If you look at the polls, the younger you get on the demographic scales, the lower support for Israel is. It seems to be achieving its goals, and I think it, it threatens future American support for Israel. Younger people are leaving college less sympathetic to Israel than when they enter. The lobby hoped that a new partnership with Israel's Ministry of Strategic Affairs will become a game-changer in the fight against BDS. 
For years we are trying to defeat the BDS and the Danish Kingsdexy movement. We are all on the defensive. And I think we should move to the offensive. Using especially cyber and internet tools to try and defeat this ugly movement. I'm really honored to present my partners here. Brigadier General Sima Vakundir, the Director General of the Ministry of Strategic Affairs. Sima, please. The fact that the Israeli government decided to be a key player means a lot, because we can bring things that usually are not existing in NGOs or civilian entities that are now enrolled in this thing. The Israeli government can look at the bigger picture and actually create this coordination and cooperation. We are the only player inside the pro-Israeli network who can actually say that he's filling the gaps. The Israeli official described to members of the lobby the first phase of the covert war. Ambiguity is part of our guidelines. That's why I'm not going to say anything too much about each one of the legs. The first okay. one is intel, intelligence, or data, or information. What we've done is mapped and analyzed the whole phenomena globally, not just the United States, not just campuses, but campuses and intersectionality and labor unions and, and churches. We started to establish a project called Israel Cyber Shield. This project is actually a civil intelligence unit that collects, analyze, and act upon the activists in the BDS movement, if it's people, organizations, or events. And we give everything we collect. We are using the most sophisticated uh, data system, intelligence system in the Israeli market. Let's take the defense activity that we're doing and make it into proactivity and offense activity. Israel has used cyber sabotage. We suffered from intense denial of service attacks, hacking attacks on our websites. Israel decided to go on cyber warfare against BDS publicly. They said, we shall spy on BDS individuals and networks, especially in the West. We have not heard a peep from any Western government complaining that Israel is admitting that it will spy on your citizens. Imagine Iran saying it will spy on, on British or American citizens. Just imagine what could happen. The Ministry of Strategic Affairs brings together this group called the Global Coalition for Israel. And it's like leading pro-Israel advocacy groups um, around the world. My view and the view of Israel's Ministry of Strategic Affairs, which we coordinate with sometimes, where we, we communicate with sometimes, is um, like Europe is lost and it's basically over. And like they're turning a lot of attention now to the US because they feel we're on your path. Can I join these? I'd love to. I don't know if you'd love me. But... It's like a pretty sensitive conversation, yeah. but it's going well. If China was doing this, if Iran was doing it, if Russia was doing it, there would be uproar. You would have Congress going after them, you would have hearings, you would have prosecutions. The question is, how does Israel get away with this? It's modeled on General Stanley McChrystal's counterinsurgency strategy in Iraq. We've copied a lot from that strategy that has been working really well for us, actually. And one of the pieces is this operations and intelligence brief. We're using social media intelligence, a tool called Radian 6. We're phasing that out over the next year, and we're bringing on more sophisticated technology that's, that's developed in Israel. An American should not be spied on by a foreign government that is able to access all this information and possibly undermine their ability to exercise their democratic rights in this country. So we're not dealing with amateurs. This is not an amateur work. We're dealing with a government that have a ministry at a ministerial level engaged in the systematic targeting of activists outside of its sovereign borders. The only way it's going to stop is if 
you know, somebody in the government uh, points out this is illegal and we're not going to tolerate it. And if we do tolerate it, other countries are going to do it as well. There's a company called Census, S-E-N-S-U-S. -S. It's like very pricey though, you know. We had to raise like hundreds of thousand dollars yeah. just for it. It's gonna increase our discovery rate. We're discovering just about everything we need. It's also going to bring new sources online that we weren't able to access in an automated fashion, like message boards. And um, we have ways to crawl message boards right now and to monitor them, but it's like disconnected from the event and activity discovery mechanism so that we want that system to be all integrated. So there, we just signed the contract yesterday for um, them to start that work. They actually already started it. Good friends in Israel that are helping us with that. You would think that since the United States has this special relationship with Israel and gives it so much largesse and protects it diplomatically at every turn and gives this assistance unconditionally, uh, that the Israelis would do less spying here than other countries do. But on the contrary, what we see is that the Israelis are, are probably at the top of the list when it comes to foreign countries spying inside the United States. Our investigation into Israel's covert war against BDS led Tony back to Julia Rifkind. She's American, and her full-time job at the Israeli embassy is monitoring BDS. She summed up a typical day at the office. Wow, it just looks like the state of Israel is employing little spies and you can't take a breath without Israel hearing about it. Julia spoke about her former days as a student. While at UC Davis, she was also an activist with APAC. The training she received from the most powerful arm of the pro-Israel lobby left its mark. I can immediately tell when meeting with somebody where they're trying to be. I like the way that I talk about them. Like, how do you say I'm an APAC training camp? Yes. Yeah, the way they call it. I can tell when somebody's on the stand with us, or David Patrick, or ICC, or Hasbara, or Kale Rose, or Like, I can tell. She's been trained really well. She follows the commands that she has been given by these Israeli organizations, and she follows it really well. I pretty much, all of my friends work at APAC, all of them. So whenever we have events at the embassy, and there's like, oh, we should invite APAC people. It's like a joke that, like, obviously, I'm going to be the one to, like, write all the emails down. So whatever, they're like, we have to submit names and, like, lists for events. Mine's, like, 15 names, and, like, 14 of them are APAC. APAC encourages the students it trains to conceal any affiliation. When you're lobbying on behalf of APAC, you don't say APAC. You say I'm a pro-Israel student from the city of this. And when you're meeting with students on campus, I would never say, like, I am the APAC campus rep. You say, my name's Julian, I'm a pro-Israel student. Like, you don't need the title, you don't need the organization. APAC's involvement in student council elections is also kept secret. APAC attracts the more political students, students who are more interested in like lobbying. We have like campaigns and stuff like that. We dealt with student elections, very behind the scenes. They actually were found to have put cameras in the rooms where there were meetings going on. I liked meeting outside where there are no rooms and there are no possible cameras under the chairs or wherever they may have put them. I have several weird Facebooks. I have my fake Facebook that I follow, like, all the SJP accounts. I have, like, some fake name. Um, my name is Jay Bernard or something. So it just sounds like an old white guy, which is the plan. Um, I tried to, I, like, joined all these groups. A lot of people haven't added me. I mean, just wanted to see on the newsfeed like what kind of articles they were sharing, just to kind of see like, what their internal dialogue was. Every single event that I put on, you would have these pro-Israel groups coming out before our guests even got there with their cameras videotaping. Julia has no contact with her handlers in Israel. She writes her intelligence briefs and awaits their instructions. I write a 
a report that I give to my boss who translates it. It's really weird. We don't like talk to them on the phone or like email or whatever. There's like a special like server that's like really secure that I don't have access to because I'm an American. You have to have like clearance to have access to the server. It's called cables. It's not even necessarily in Hebrew. It's like literally cables. I've seen it. It looks really bizarre. So I write reports that my boss translates into the cables and sends them and then they'll send something back and then he'll translate it and tell me what I need to do. If she believes it's spying on activists to suppress a free speech movement, then, you know, peace be to her. And um, I hope she feels good sleeping at night being on that side of things. We're a group of student activists advocating for Palestinian human rights. And to think that we, we're, we're so upsetting and threatening to a state is pretty awe striking to me. Um, Creepy, but also, I guess, makes me more proud of the work I did. It's nice uh, kind of seeing what they're talking about. What do they say? They don't talk about like our side at all, which is disappointing, so it'd be like, nice to do the drama. But um, it's mainly them sharing their like, videos, their like, AJ Plus videos on yeah. Al Jazeera. What did you think about Al Jazeera? It sucks because they have a lot of interesting like liberal videos, which I'm like, wow, like that's amazing to hear about that human rights issue, and hear about that like sexism situation, yeah. or whatever. And they'll show like why Israel is an apartheid state, and you're like, like, not anymore. So that's what's annoying is that it gets you know tied to all those causes. That's hard to be liberal. You represent that government. I can't say anything negative about BB or like the government because I don't really work for them. Not directly. I'm just a normal American. In episode two, Tony discovers how the lobby raises funds for congressmen. Basically, they hit him an envelope with 20 credit card numbers. For all the like, legal reasons, it's just people pool their money. Handing over a quarter million dollars. That buys a lawmaker. And how a row over anti-Semitism swept through the University of Tennessee. You have to show that they're racist hate groups and to consistently portray them that way. Previously on The Lobby USA, spying on American students, a worker at the Israeli embassy describes her remit to our undercover reporter. I bring the gallery to tell a reporting back to Israel. That's a lot of what I do. It's a report back to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Strategic Affairs. It's part of a covert campaign to influence America's youth. We have three different sub-campaigns, data gathering, working on activist organization, money trail. Wow. It just looks like the state of Israel is employing little spies. In the second of a four-part series, how the pro-Israel lobby influences Congress, and as our undercover reporter gains greater trust, he is offered an extraordinary assignment. Using an undercover reporter, Al Jazeera's investigative unit infiltrates one of the most powerful lobbies in the world. Getting $38 billion in security into Israel matters, which is what APAC is doing. We examine how the lobby led by APAC, the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee, has secured unwavering support in Congress. Congressmen don't do anything unless you pressure them. And the only way to do that is with money. What the lobby is all about 
is to make sure that Israel gets special treatment from the United States forever. But after occupying Palestinian lands for half a century, the pro-Israel lobby is facing a new challenge. We called for a full boycott of Israel, divesting from it, and eventually imposing sanctions on it to achieve UN stipulated rights of the Palestinian people. A movement to boycott, divest, and impose sanctions on Israel, BDS, was formed on American campuses. It seems to be achieving its goals. It threatens future American support for Israel. We believe in justice for all people. So that means the occupation has to end. Israel's Ministry of Strategic Affairs responded with a covert operation to defeat BDS. It's a psychological campaign involving spying and smears. You discredit the messenger as a way of discrediting the message. Just stay on message. And what is that message? BDS is a hate movement. While our reporter monitored pro-Israel groups, he was asked to go undercover for the lobby. You're going into enemy territory. It's not for everybody. In Washington, Tony often socialized with younger members of the pro-Israel lobby. Here, the discussions are focused on influencing elites. Recent graduates appear to no longer care about debates they had at university. We try and go through student government and pass bills. I mean, you know, looking back on it now, it's all it's total crap. So, yes, in general, obviously. But also, it's just, I don't know, it doesn't do anything. I mean, fighting back against it has no practical effect. What has a practical effect is getting Congress to give Israel military aid. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what happens at the University of X. What matters is what happens here, what matters is what happens in the capitals of the state, the capitals of other countries. The pro-Israel lobby is keen to co-opt elites beyond America. At a party organized by APAC, Tony met an intern at a public relations firm whose clients include the United Arab Emirates. The lobby apparently has allies in the Arab world. The American Jewish Committee is running a study tour to, it's either Dubai or Abu Dhabi, and they're talking about mutual cooperation. the ties like between the UAE and Israel. They're getting so much better. Nobody knows. The governments have to coordinate on security. It's all under the table. They're on trade, security, tech, medicine, with a lot of cooperation. Basically where I see it standing right now is the GCC has all this under-the-table cooperation with Israel, and it's getting to the point where it's getting to the surface. Does the UAE have a stake in BDS? They do run all the time the argument of Palestinian suffering and occupation. They do kind of toe that line, but that's because they have to, to save face in the air and wait. They're literally just trying to cover their bases. Are they actually helping out BDS in any way? They benefit from Israeli tech, so yeah. they're not going to they're not going to boycott that. Why would they? Tony's boss at the Israel Project used to work at APAC, where debate about Israel's actions or Palestinian rights were rarely prominent. Does the war of ideas matter? I don't know. I don't know. I, I know that like getting thirty-eight billion dollars in security aid does not matter, which is what APAC just did. But I'm proud to be have been a part of for so long. My job was basically to convince students that participating in the war of ideas on campus is actually a distraction. You can hold up signs and have rallies on campus, but the Congress gets $3.1 billion a year for Israel. 
Everything APAC does is focused on enforcing Congress. Congress is where you have leverage, so you, you can't influence the President of the United States directly, but the Congress can. APAC is very interested in making sure that every representative and every senator toes the line on Israel. And uh, it is highly effective in that regard. That's why it's considered to be synonymous in many people's heads with the lobby. APAC's website shows members of Congress attending its conferences and declaring their support for Israel. And on behalf of Congress, thank you for sending a clear and unequivocal message to the world that the United States stands with Israel now, tomorrow, and always. I reject the BDS movement, whether it be on campuses in France and London or right here in the United States of America. To get elected in the American political system, you need lots of money. What APAC does is it makes sure that money is funneled your way if you're seen as pro-Israel, and it'll go to significant lengths to make sure that you stay in office if you continue to be uh, staunchly pro-Israel. May God bless Israel. May God bless the United States of America. May God bless you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. They have questionnaires. Anybody running for Congress is expected to fill out a questionnaire. And they evaluate the depth of your commitment to Israel on the basis of that question. And then you have an interview with local people. If you get APAC support, then more often than not, you're going to win. Jim Moran is a Democrat who represented a congressional district in Northern Virginia. You realize it's not just the money, it's the number of concerned activists. They'll send out postcards, they'll make phone calls, they'll organize. I mean, that's the democratic process. They understand the democratic process. We made sure that there were people in every single congressional district. And then you'd call them up and say, I'm calling from APAC in Washington. I did these calls. We hear that you're good friends with Congressman so-and-so. Oh, my God, yes. We've been friends since elementary school. Well, what does he think about Israel? I never talked to him about Israel. Well, can I come down and talk to you and help you figure out a way to talk to him about Israel? No, just tell me. What should I say? I don't have to. I'll just tell him. Our undercover reporter wanted to learn more about how funding is secured for congressmen. Speaking of the devil. David Oakes, a prominent pro-Israel advocate, invited Tony to a fundraising event. Oakes later called him to discuss the details. Is it just a social event? No, hold on. I'm going to email you a list of the people that this group supports. This is the biggest ad hoc political group, and I'm definitely the wealthiest in DC. Hold on. Mark Kirk, the senator from Illinois. Ted Deutsch from Florida. Barbara Comstock, she's the Congressman from Virginia, Richard Byrd from South Carolina, Kelly Ayotte, she's fantastic, she's in the Arms Committee. They'll walk in the room and they'll say everything here is off the record, and then they'll say, here's a little bit about me, and then people will ask very specific questions. The fundraiser was being held in a wealthy suburb of Washington. A big tech room. It makes a difference, it really, really does. It's the best bang for your buck, and the networking is phenomenal. Congressmen and senators don't do anything unless you pressure them. They kick the can down the road unless you pressure them. And the only way to do that is with money. Right now, our current contribution limit from any person to a candidate is $2,700. Now, that's a lot of money, you know, and, and that can certainly buy us some gratitude with the lawmaker. But if you really want to add punch to uh, that type of buying of favors, what you do is you get 50 or 100 people together at an event like this, all chipping in $2,700, and then you bundle it all together and hand over the total amount to the lawmaker. At that point, we're talking anywhere up to a quarter million dollars. So suddenly you've got a group of people 
with the same demand they want from the lawmaker handing over a quarter million dollars. That buys a lawmaker. The fundraiser was for Anthony Brown, who ran for Congress in November 2016. This is direct spending. Brown's going to use that 30 grand to do ad campaigns. So they strategically pick the ones who are in the close group that they want to build relationships with. Uh huh. So we want the Jewish community to go face to face in a small environment, 50, 30, 40 people, and say, This is what's important to us. We wanted to make sure if we give you money that you're going to enforce the Iran deal. That way, when they need something from him or her, like the Iran deal, they can quickly mobilize and say, look, we'll give you 30 grand. They actually impact it. He's actually saying, we're buying this, these office holders. And that's the point. We're chipping in all this money so we can hand over 100,000 or 200,000 to the office holders so we can buy them. They're not supposed to advertise. There's yeah. only the advertising law. I would surprised they had an invite. I've never seen an actual invite before. Oakes described a similar event he attended in New York, which included donors from Wall Street. In New York, which is Jeff Talbot, we don't ask a goddamn thing about the Palestinians. You know why? Because it's a tiny issue, that's why. It's a small, insignificant issue. The big issue is Iran. We want everything focused on Iran. What happens is Jeff meets with the congressman in the back room, tells them exactly what his goals are. And by the way, Jeff Calkins is worth $250 million. Basically, they hand him an envelope with 20 credit cards and say, you can swipe each of these credit cards for $1,000 each. There is a disclosure law that is designed to highlight whether there may be potential money laundering going on in events like this. And that is if the funds are earmarked. Uh, and that means the organization has to disclose who showed up at that event and how much each individual chipped in and what they handed over to the lawmaker. What's the name of the group that puts this on? It doesn't have a name. There's no name. It's an ad hoc political group. For all the like, legal reasons, people pool their money. What this specific group is doing to try to avoid that disclosure requirement, it isn't taking money and then putting it in its own account and then handing it over to the office holder. It's just collecting credit card information and then turning that over directly to the candidate. Therefore, it's not violating the earmarking law and they're not reporting this. All we would see on the campaign finance reports are the individuals who contributed. But there'd be no record on those campaign finance reports that they worked together as a bundling group, that they were all at this event. All we'd know is person A gave 2,700, person B gave 2,700, and we'd have no idea they're working in, in tandem with each other. The one in New York is 10 grand over two cycles. It's a minimum commitment. Some people give a lot more than that. Whatever your commitment is, so like if you give five thousand, you definitely ensure that we don't that I don't go over the twenty six hundred. Do you know what I'm saying? If one is at a meeting where person A wants to give five thousand, another person has only one hundred dollars to give, and that person gave two and a half thousand to the other person at that meeting as a gift, and they both therefore gave a total of five thousand, five thousand one hundred. Would that be illegal? That would be illegal. That would be laundering of campaign contributions. The limit applies to the individual. And so each individual is subject to that $2,700 limit. And if any individual goes over that limit, they are violating the contribution limit. They cannot legally do that by laundering money through other individuals. If you give 5000 you definitely ensure that we don't I don't go over the 2600. You know what I'm saying? During a cab journey across Washington, Tony's boss at the Israel Project, Eric, spoke about his former job as a fundraiser for Jeb Bush. I was one of the first uh, employees of the Bush campaign. The first time Trump came up in a conversation was we were going to solicit him for Jeb. 
And we're like, why isn't he writing a check? We would joke, like, this is the donor who went nuts. Eric shares his concerns about Jeb Bush's campaign. I hope the Justice Department doesn't make an example out of Bush because we were operating in a real gray zone. And we raised enough money, we figured, you know, cut, let them come at us, we'll defend ourselves. We thought he's going to be the Republican nominee, everyone did at that stage. A relatively small number of families supply hundreds of millions of dollars annually to lobby politicians. The 200 families whose giving constitutes 90% of all political giving are not giving because they want a government contract or because it's good for their business. They're doing it because they actually care. In my view, it's obscene how much money there is. One of the most effective uses of the lobby's funds occurs when Congress is on its break. Every year, they fly hundreds of members of Congress to Israel uh, for these extended travel junkets that are, that are really lavish. They're first-rate vacations. They'll rack up $20,000 or more for a vacation for a member of Congress. The member can bring along their spouse, and they have a great time. You are told that Israel continues to be under siege from hundreds of millions of its neighbors who are Muslim and who hate Israel, who hate Jewish people. You're told that Israel survives because of the United States and because of American politicians like you uh, who support us. An attempt was made to change the law so that all expenses paid trips would be considered a bribe. I drafted legislation to try to reform the whole profession of lobbying to get rid of free travel and gifts from lobbyists. The Honest Leadership and Open Government Act of 2007 significantly enhanced the travel restrictions that if you're an organization that employs a lobbyist, you can only provide a one-day trip for a member of Congress. Then APAC exerted its influence. There was a major loophole written into the travel restriction that was essentially engineered by APAC, and this loophole is widely known as the APAC loophole. The clause excluded educational trips organized by a charity that didn't hire lobbyists. APAC happened to be affiliated to such a charity. It doesn't have an office. It doesn't have any employees. It's just a tax form that they filed. Gifts of dinner, gifts of wonderful resorts to stay at, gifts of entertainment, all of which is packed up into one of these trips is a very, very effective tool at influence peddling. Most of our donors were like the dicks, you know, yeah. the schleppers. Um, there's, the quality is starting to improve. We're attracting more impressive people. Until recently, you know, the people we're attracting, you know, is the guy who's wealthy, gives away 25,000 a year, 10,000 is to us, and this is his hobby and full-time job, and he won't shut the f up or stop calling. We're finally starting to expand into the class of donors that APAC has, which is like the more elite, easier to work with, smart, strategic, you know, writing big checks kind of like. It takes just as much time to get a $10,000 check from someone as it does getting $500,000. The money raised by APAC doesn't just fund congressmen who support their goals. If you wander off the reservation and you become critical of Israel, you not only will not get money, APAC will go to great lengths to find somebody to run against you and uh, support that person very generously. And the end result is you're likely to lose your seat in Congress. They threaten. They immediately threaten. Even if they know that APAC can't defeat them, APAC can make their lives more difficult. They can make sure that their next town meeting or something uh, some members of the Jewish congregation jump up and say, but you're anti-Israel. In 2002, APAC was lobbying Moran to vote for the invasion of Iraq. The executive director of uh, APAC said that his most important accomplishment was securing the authorization for the use of US military force in Iraq. APAC was pushing it very hard. Why does APAC benefit from the United States going to war? The United States getting involved in wars in the Middle East is ultimately in Israel's interest, because we have a stake in the region. Congressman Moran refused to vote for the invasion, as APAC requested. There are compelling, fundamental reasons why this body should oppose 
this resolution. Then at a public meeting, he was asked a question. A Jewish woman actually stood up in the town hall. And she said, uh, why aren't more Jews involved in the marches against the war? I said, if the leaders of the Jewish community were opposed to the war, I think that would make a difference. The lobby reacted, claiming this was evidence of Moran's belief in a Jewish conspiracy that was leading America to war. There was a conservative rabbi in my district who was assigned to me, I assume, by APEC. And he had warned me that if I voiced my views about the Israeli lobby, that my career would be over and implied that it would be done through the Post. And sure enough, the, the Washington Post editorialized brutally. Everybody ganged up. So what are the main outlets that TIP work with? Washington Post is the biggest one. OK. Isn't that like just down there or something? Yeah. It's actually that building. Moran claims the Washington Post's editorial board has a close relationship with APAC. The principal editorial board of the Post itself has been a very effective instrument. Because they've been able to maintain their credibility, and, and it's a great paper in every other way, but because they have such credibility, they're extremely effective. Everyone knew he wasn't anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitism has come to mean anti-Israel. The APAC crowd doesn't really care very much about whether or not a person likes Jews or wants one to move next door. All they care about is what their position is on Israel. Both of my daughters married Jewish men. My grandchildren are Jewish. Anybody that considers me anti-Semite is ignorant. In part two, a battle over the definition of anti-Semitism on America's campuses. There are those who claim, oh yeah, we're trying to stop anti-Semitism, but what they're actually trying to do is stop advocacy for Palestinian human rights. In part one, our undercover reporter discovered that many young people in the pro-Israel lobby have given up debating the BDS movement on campus. Try and go through student government and pass bills. I mean, you know, looking back on it now, it's all it's total crap. Fighting back against it has no practical effect. I know. What has a practical effect is getting Congress to give Israel a military. Tony was attending a party run by an advocacy group that he joined. A journalist then approached him with an extraordinary proposition. He wanted Tony to work undercover for the lobby at a meeting of BDS activists. For the algae miner, so we're trying to recruit someone to go undercover just to go there and just, and just, and just see what's going on. Okay. And I, think, I think the person would get paid for it, too. Yeah. I'm just going to sign up, do that profile, and just kind of like, see what's going on. Uh, higher up, you know, they just want to email today. Like, you know anyone who can do this? For some reason, he popped into my head. A few days later, a journalist from the Algaminer contacted Tony. It would be undercover and have to be kept pretty quiet. We would like to have some recording device on your person. Any level of potential danger or, you know, difficulty, violence or verbal assault, none of that concerns you or puts you off? No, because I think I'm pretty good at just being kind of zen in the face of um, verbal assaults. The Algemeiner claims to be the fastest growing Jewish newspaper in America. It pays particular attention to events on college campuses. We're working on a project now about ranking U.S. universities and colleges in terms of their anti-Semitic and anti-Israel activity. 
we have a campus bureau that monitors this sort of behavior and these incidents and these campaigns all day long, all week long. The Algemeiner often reports that anti-Semitism exists amongst pro-Palestinian student groups. The language that comes from those arenas move into that sphere of the new anti-Semitism, which is anti-Israelism. And that's a big focus at the Campus Bureau, looking at the blurring of those lines and where those boundaries have eroded. As journalists, right, exposure is, is the goal, exposing truth. In August 2016, a story in the Algemeiner caused waves in Washington's pro-Israel circles. The thing that I'm working on, you might have seen the news recently about a successful anti-Semitism at the University of Tennessee. So the expose was on these anti-Semitic tweets. They uncovered 14 current students, five recent graduates at the University of Tennessee that had tweeted all of these horribly anti-Semitic things. The evidence was released by an anonymous group within the pro-Israel lobby. They're called Canary Missions. Nobody really knows who they are. No. Um, they expose anti-Semitism, anti-Israelism, and anti-Americanism in the U.S., like on college campuses. They like study it and then release these like expose reports, but they're they're secret. Like they don't reveal who they are. The University of Tennessee is based in Knoxville, a quiet city in the east of the state. Tennessee is conservative and religious. The Christian church has political influence here. Six out of 10 voters opted for Donald Trump. At the university, students and professors, including opponents of BDS, were taken aback by the headlines. It said that there was rampant anti-Semitism at the University of Tennessee. This was quite a shock. It was very surreal and strange. I didn't see anything happening on the ground. It, it all seemed to be um, internet-based. There's this international headline with our names and this defamation of our characters. It was the last thing that we were expecting to happen. I was surprised that they were targeting the University of Tennessee. I mean, there's just not a whole lot going on in Knoxville. It just seems such a benign target. Several tweets were clear-cut examples of anti-Semitism. Some failed to distinguish between Jewish people and the state of Israel. Others made vile references to the horrors of the Holocaust. There were definitely some very anti-Semitic things said, but it seemed to be by a limited number of students. Those tweets are horrible, and that should not be supported by anybody. One of the students, there were tweets from when they were 14, 15, and 16 years old. People do and say stupid things. Students who are campaigning for Palestinian equal rights were immediately suspicious believing the Algemeiner had another motive in running the headline. The way that I saw that article was that to discredit some of the work that we were doing, they threw in these people who are a part of the Muslim community or a part of the Arab community around Knoxville and things that they had said, things that they had done. They were very old a lot of times before people had gotten to college. I think this is just old stuff that's being dug up for lack of any other material. I was really horrified that you had essentially this, this, this blacklist of um, students. The list included Summer Awad, a Palestinian American. She was accused of supporting terrorism after sharing a Facebook post. In that image, I mean, all it is is showing different tools of Palestinian resistance. One of them's BDS, one of them's stones, and the one that they circled <laughs> happens to be the knife. They obviously have much bigger weapons than, than the Palestinians can even imagine having, but they're just able to frame this image of violence and to frame this image of defending themselves. Shortly after being named by Canary Mission, 
Posters and flyers link BDS supporters to Hamas. There was a list of most of the names of the students that were mentioned in the Canary Mission. All I kept seeing were flyers all over the place. Like, they'll put it on cars, they'll put it on side tables in the student centers and stuff like that. That kind of scared me to think that there are actually people physically on campus posting these things. Back in Washington, Aviva is drafting a letter to the University of Tennessee on behalf of the Brandeis Center. They want the university to take a stand. We're telling them that basically they need to issue a stronger statement. They need to investigate the students that were involved. They need to offer education and training. In addition to drawing attention to those responsible for anti-Semitic tweets, their orchestrated release served another purpose. It's part of a wider campaign by the pro-Israel lobby. The problem right now, I think, on universities is that administrations don't realize that anti-Israel statements or anti-Zionist statements often are also anti-Semitic. To find out what anti-Semitism means for the lobby, Tony visits Aviva's boss at the Brandeis Center for Human Rights in Washington. Despite its name, it's a pro-Israel lobby group. Hi. Hi. It's great to finally meet you. Really good to meet you. Yeah. Kenneth Marcus is involved in the lobby's attempt to redefine anti-Semitism in a way that could include criticism of the state of Israel. Right now, the challenge is, is that there are people who say, you know what, anti-Israel politics have nothing to do with anti-Semitism. Well, you've got to show that they're not the same, but they're not entirely different either. The goal is to have the federal government to establish a definition of anti-Semitism that is parallel to the State Department definition. The US State Department defines anti-Semitism using a three-point test known as the three Ds. It includes statements that demonize Israel, those that apply double standards, or those that delegitimize the state. There have been attempts by some to try to define anti-Semitism in such a way that conflates actual anti-Semitism with completely legitimate criticism of Israel or Israeli government policies. They are overly broad and vague to the point where any kind of criticism of Israel or of Israeli government policies can be labeled as anti-Semitic. One of the major tactics that the lobby uses to defend Israel, and it's done this for a long period of time, but it's using it more and more these days, is to identify people who criticize Israel as an anti-Semite. The letter that Aviva was sending called for the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, to address a long-standing problem of anti-Semitism on campus. The Brandeis Center is urging American universities to adopt a definition of anti-Semitism that could include criticism of Israel. We are trying to get universities to adopt a uniform definition, whether it's the State Department's definition or a similar version of it, because then we think that the administrators would be able to understand anti-Semitism better and discipline students for hateful and discriminatory actions. The Brandeis Center also wanted the university to screen what they described as a path-breaking film called Unmasked Judeophobia. It was made by a member of staff at the university and featured Kenneth Marcus. It is now socially acceptable to say lots of different things that were not acceptable in the past. Anti-Israelism and anti-Semitism is one example. It tries to make the claim that Muslims have adopted Nazi-like anti-Semitism and are going to essentially lead the next Holocaust on the Jews. The film positions anti-Semitism at the heart of the BDS movement. It was not sponsored by the chancellor, but it was held at the law school, and Ken Marcus did attend. It was screened on the day that commemorates victims of the Holocaust. The film was not appropriate for Holocaust Remembrance Day. As a scholar of the Holocaust and anti-Semitism, I would just say the film's conclusions didn't meet scholarly standards.
Exactly why Washington's pro-Israel lobby is concerned by events in Tennessee is at first hard to understand. Until one considers the growth of evangelical Christianity in the southern states. Tennessee is a Bible Belt state, and the capital of Tennessee is known as the buckle of the Bible Belt. And that good old Southern Christian culture is very strong here, and a big part of that has now become this, this rhetoric of Christian Zionism. Satan hates Israel and the Jews <laughs> because Israel's restoration initiated the last days of Bible prophecy. Christian Zionists believe that for the end of times to come, for Christ to return, it's necessary for Israel to control all of what was historically considered to be Israeli territory. Based on prophecy, Jesus Christ could never have returned for the church to resurrect the dead in Christ until Jerusalem was first in the hands of Israel and the capital of Israel. Christian Zionists and Christian organizations that, that lobby on behalf of the Israeli government. A lot of them have a theology, uh, which I think is in many ways anti-Semitic. The Jews have to leave the West. It says in your Bible, God will bring them back to Israel from the West. It instrumentalizes Jews in such a way that their goal is that all Jews around the world will leave where they live and move to Israel because in their theology that is what will lead to the coming of the Messiah again and then all the Jews will convert or <laughs> will all be killed. Leaders of the Christian Zionist lobby threw their weight behind the Trump election campaign. I have been asked 101 times plus, why do you think Donald Trump won? And I have an immediate answer because he was the only one that was blessing Israel. The evangelicals flooded the voting booths this time like at no time in our history. And a lot of the laws that are being enacted in those states that are pro-Israel, anti-BDS, uh, are coming about in part because there is so much sympathy for Israel in that community, which has a lot of political power. Senate Joint Resolution 170, by about a resolution to condemn boycott, disinvestment, sanctions, movement, and increasing incidents of anti-Semitism. In 2015, Tennessee became the first state legislature to condemn BDS. It's the result of the lobby's attempt to use legal means to quell BDS on campus. In recent light of anti-Semitic things that have happened here in Tennessee on our college campuses, we are just expressing our support as an ally for the state of Israel. And with that, I renew my motion. It made it seem as though there's this huge Palestinian liberation like movement happening in this state. That's the way that it was presented at the legislature, was that we need to stop this before it, it, it takes over our state. There's uh, an intensive effort by Israel and pro-Israel groups to get governments, universities, legislative bodies to adopt a definition of anti-Semitism that includes criticism of Israel and its state ideology, Zionism. We're the space where a lot of these things are initially brought and tested. The rough drafts, like the beta version, comes here. And then you'll see that same bill go into another legislator the following year. According to their definition, if I say to you that I believe that instead of separate Israeli and Palestinian states, there should be a single state where Jews, Christians, Muslims, atheists, everyone has full equal rights the way they do under the Constitution of the United States, that would make me an anti-Semite because I'm denying Israel's right to be a Jewish state. How to define anti-Semitism? I would say hatred, discrimination, violence, uh, animus towards Jews for being Jewish, I would say is the broadest definition of anti-Semitism. They have created this perverse definition of anti-Semitism, where calling for everyone in Palestine, Israel to have equal rights is somehow an attack on Jews. And they're trying to get this 
pushed into official definitions. And this has been a key goal of people like Kenneth Marcus and the Brandeis Center, so that they can then go after people who are advocating for equality and bring them up on charges that they're actually anti-Semitic bigots. You have to show that they're racist hate groups uh, and that they are using intimidation to, uh, to get funded uh, and to consistently portray them that way. Six months after the Algemeiner ran its report, an anti-Semitism awareness bill was brought before Tennessee's State Assembly. The bill incorporates the three D's definition, which can include criticism of Israel. Kenneth Marcus gave evidence. When I had read a newspaper article in a major national Jewish uh, newspaper indicating some issues, we independently verified several different issues going on with blogging, I think it was Facebook entries, Nazi type references to Jews um, and, and the need to kill Jews. They may have dealt with that, but it seems to me it's an indication that the problem is here. In order to create enough sort of political momentum and hysteria to get these bills through, you need to show that anti-Semitism is rife on campuses. You see groups like the Brandeis Center jumping on headlines, which are very dramatic and very scary. Incidents like the one that they claimed happened at the University of Tennessee are certainly helpful in a political sense if you're trying to push legislation like that through. Have a right to exist. Aviva Vogelstein also traveled to Tennessee. If a student on a campus says, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, meaning that from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea, there will be no state of Israel, that, that would be considered anti-Semitic. Um, another example would be when students on campus chant things like, Intifada, Intifada, we support the Intifada. That's calling for, an Intifada uh, is calling for violence against innocent Israeli civilians. Um, and that is an, an incitement to violence. And it's calling for demonization and delegitimization of Israel. Seven months earlier, when Aviva was writing the letter to the University of Tennessee, she was talking to a leader of the Jewish community in Knoxville. It seems that she told Aviva that the University of Tennessee doesn't have a long-standing problem of anti-Semitism. She's like, I've been on campus for 10 years, and there have been no, like, actual incidents of anti-Semitism. Like, these tweets are obviously and they need to be addressed. It's very misleading that they're calling this a cesspool of anti-Semitism. Jewish students at the University of Tennessee repeated this sentiment before the state legislature. When people say things like we're experiencing anti-Semitism, it, it hits us pretty hard. Um, when we were told that this was being said about our university and the climate on our university, we were really confused because we had never heard um, any about any form of anti-Semitism that was happening on our campus. So this was kind of, you know, the first thing to come to us. So if we're the students who are supposed to have been um, affected by this so-called climate, you would think we would kind of know about it before. There's no evidence that there's sort of an atmosphere of intimidation against Jewish students. Once you look behind the headlines at Tennessee, that's what everybody said. I think it's important to highlight that um, any allegations that this bill is based off of, those allegations are purely uh, external allegations, meaning they're coming from um, all over the country except for Tennessee. Everybody agreed on that. The only people who didn't agree were the people coming from outside the university, Kenneth Marcus and others, who have the agenda to present the University of Tennessee and other campuses as dangerous places for Jewish students. One of the consequences of the allegations of anti-Semitism has been to temper activism for Palestinian equal rights. You can look at this campus in the last eight months and see that there has been little to no activism on that forefront. I would say last year this time, we had a new sort of like adrenaline underneath us, and then this kind of completely killed our fire. And it was hard to gain that momentum once again. Remember that there is two steps in the lobby's game plan. The first is to put out a story that's very favorable to Israel. But the second step is to do everything possible to minimize the amount of debate there is about Israel and silence the other side as much as possible. 
After Aviva spoke to Jewish students in Tennessee, she also learned that their greatest concern is unrelated to pro-Palestinian activism. BDS is not a real movement on the campus. Students for justice in Palestine, which has like a large following nationwide, has like very few active student members. And mostly we have problems with um, Christians trying to proselytize the Jewish students. Because in the South, like, everyone is so, like, it's like, oh, you I find it incredibly troubling that at a time when we see a rise in real broad daylight anti-Semitism in the United States, there are those who claim, oh yeah, we're trying to stop anti-Semitism, but what they're actually trying to do is stop advocacy for Palestinian human rights. A short time later, the Algemeine contacted Tony once more to discuss his proposed mission, to work undercover at a BDS event. The editor explained what they wanted. One of the projects that we've been looking to do for quite a while is to try and uh, infiltrate some of these groups, get undercover and discover what they're about from the inside. You explain the war, there's a hostile environment and there's some risk involved. The goal would really be to uncover any evidence of not just uh, bias, but, you know, real bigotry, the correlation between the BDS movement and hatred of Jews. Tony is given a list of persons of interest. They're all on the Canary Mission website. Go to canarymission.org. Have you heard of Canary Mission? Mm, a little bit. Could you tell me about it? People who hate it, the people who are being targeted by it, call it a blacklist. You have names here that show up on this database. Students and professors, faculty, speakers, organizations that have ties to terrorism, outright ties to terrorism or terrorists who have called to the destruction of the Jewish state. Despite running Canary Mission's Tennessee expose, the Algemeiner staff say Canary's identity is still a mystery. It's an anonymous site. Nobody has any idea who's actually running this thing, and people have tried and looked into it. If you're on board in terms of concepts, then I guess the next thing we just need to figure out is the money. Can we wait for a follow-up email from you? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I should get that to you within the next 24 hours. Coming up in episode three of The Lobby, how anonymous websites smear pro-Palestinian activists on campus. It was really an attempt by people who didn't know us to think, maybe I can destroy this marriage at the very least. It's psychological warfare. Drives them crazy. They're terrified of Canary Mission. And we reveal for the first time the people behind Canary Mission. Previously on The Lobby USA, our undercover reporter revealed tactics used against supporters of Palestinian equal rights. You have to show that they're racist hate groups and to consistently portray them that way. Tony is being recruited to work undercover for The Lobby. It's a hostile environment and there's some risk involved. His assignment? To investigate people on a blacklist drawn up by a website called Canary Mission. It's an anonymous site. Nobody has any idea who's actually running this thing, and people have tried and looked into it. In the third of a four-part series, Personal Attacks, Smears on Anonymous Websites, how sections of the pro-Israel lobby use unscrupulous means to discredit supporters of Palestinian civil rights. Using an undercover reporter, Al Jazeera's investigative unit infiltrates one of the most powerful lobbies in the world. We're getting $38 billion in security agents for all matters, which is what APAC is doing. We examine how the lobby, led by APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, has secured unwavering support in Congress. Congressmen don't do anything unless you pressure them. And the only way to do that is with money. What the lobby is all about is to make sure that Israel gets special treatment from the United States forever. 
that after occupying Palestinian lands for half a century, the pro-Israel lobby is facing a new challenge. We called for a full boycott of Israel, divesting from it and eventually imposing sanctions on it to achieve UN stipulated rights of the Palestinian people. A movement to boycott, divest and impose sanctions on Israel, BDS, was formed on American campuses. It seems to be achieving its goals. It threatens future American support for Israel. We believe in justice for all people. That means the occupation has to end. Israel's Ministry of Strategic Affairs responded with a covert operation to defeat BDS. The Israeli government leverages Jewish organizations yes. in the diaspora. Absolutely. It's a psychological campaign involving spying and smears. You discredit the messenger as a way of discrediting the message. Just stay on message. And what is that message? BDS is a hate movement. While our reporter monitored pro-Israel groups, he was asked to go undercover for the lobby. You're going into enemy territory, not for everybody. During his summer in Washington, Tony investigated how the lobby is responding to the growing support for BDS among students. APAC has an established network across high schools and universities and is also part of the wider campus coalition against BDS. I represent the school, so I can connect you to Georgetown, GW, American. I think that you would really benefit from a conversation with the Israel on campus coalition. They also coordinate a lot between organizations. The Israel on Campus Coalition is a coordinating group at the front line of the battle against BDS. We built up this massive national political campaign to crush them and to fight back and to fight fire with fire. What we saw was a growing global movement to destroy Israel that was manifesting on American college campuses. It makes sense that they would try to poison the next generation. The one thing every member of Congress and president and ambassador and newspaper editor has in common is by and large they spent a little bit of time on a college campus and probably those were formative years. The Israel on Campus Coalition is at the center of the lobby's response to BDS. There are about 100, maybe 120 now, professionals that are working for a dozen national ICC partner organizations like APAC and Hasbara Fellowships and Stand With Us and Hillel and Chabad and API. Stand With Us and the ICC have a particularly close relationship. The Israel on Campus Coalition, they really oversee like the whole movement. They're sort of the ones that like have the bird's eye view. Let's just say like next week a BDS resolution comes to campus. So the ICC will be the ones, they'll organize a conference call with all the partners. So they might say, okay, stay with us, we need a little bit more of your help because we need something regarding like what's in the BDS resolution. The campus newspaper wants us to write like an op-ed. Can you guys help like the op-ed? So they'll sort of be the ones and they'll sort of be overseeing it. One of Tony's fellow researchers at the Israel Project had also worked with Stand With Us. One evening, Amanda told him how the work she'd been asked to do often made her feel uneasy. And stuff we produced, yeah. I felt was like, yeah. Yeah. It would be like pictures of Palestinian kids with a knife. Those videos of like kids gonna like stab people, like we need to put this on Facebook and they have to make memes, like do like graphics about like that. It was in everything. Yeah. 
It was in my presentation of Palestine and Terror Center. Oh, okay. college students. That's, that's and high school students. Guys. But no. And it was like on our Facebook so like pages. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, you told me about that guy who was like telling me to like, use racist, like use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Were they going to universities and using that kind of language? Yeah, or? universities, articles, Facebook, everything. At the Israel Project's offices, Amanda confided further in Tony. Her boss at Stand With Us instructed her to call BDS a racist hate group as often as possible, she said, because it polls well. Stand With Us also had what she described as a covert group which would slander people as anti-Semites. It made her feel uncomfortable. Amanda recalled how Stand With Us was involved at her university. Students who criticized Israel's treatment of Palestinians were routinely accused of anti-Semitism. The pro-Israel side would say things like, it's anti-Semitic. Say things like, why are they targeting Israel and not other Arab countries? You know, like, look at all this bad stuff happening to other places and, um, you know, and Israel is like a democracy. Like, they would just say all this stuff that was like so irrelevant. Do you think that there have been well intentioned activists on American campuses who have found themselves in very difficult situations because these pro Israel groups have tarnished them as anti Semites? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Stand With Us holds an annual conference in Los Angeles. Its focus is on how to fight the BDS movement. To reveal the true nature of BDS, a venomous, deceitful, anti-peace, anti-coexistence movement that will settle for nothing short of the annihilation of the Jewish state. Jacob Bain from the Israel on Campus Coalition linked BDS to the rise in anti-Semitic hate crimes in America. Anti-Semitism is increasing in general, right? In the same way that we're seeing anti-Semitism increase in the community, we're seeing these awful, terrifying desecrations of Jewish cemeteries. The campus is no exception. At a social event held by a pro-Israel advocacy group, Tony finds out more about Stand With Us. Many here are recent graduates with backgrounds in student politics. I was the chief of staff for my friend who is our student senator. We had Stand With Us write some checks, but we didn't let them put a logo on it. What? It's just our names on the logo. We didn't want that association because on Berkeley campus, if you don't know, they hate Stand With Us as well as working behind the scenes to provide funds, Stand With Us helps pro-Israel groups denounce students who support equal rights for Palestinians. We've used Stand With Us strategically on my campus to have them publish stuff when we want it to publish. One girl that was running for our student senate, her last name's Dick, to my The summer of 2014, the Gaza bombings happened. There's a lot of activity in the Bay Area, a lot of protests. You hear like, intifada, intifada, intifada. So, and I asked someone, I was like, oh, what does that mean? When Sumaya stood for the student senate at Berkeley, the Arabic word meaning uprising inspired her election slogan. My last name means uh, faith and governance, a way of life. There was other hashtags, so it was like Din for the Win, Din Dynasty, um, and then I really liked them. So when I launched my campaign, it just seemed fitting to launch it with, um, you know, hashtag Dintifada. 
she ran on the hashtag Dintabata. That's her like Dintabata. Her last name's Din. So my Din. And we're like, this isn't okay. Stand with us and launched a social media assault on Samaya's campaign and her character. We had a campaign party, the launch party, and an hour later, I get I'm getting all these messages. We had stand with us attack this girl in an ar article. Well, at least on their say. Facebook, right? They shared the screenshots and stuff and talked about like this isn't okay. The next day, Stand With Us completely took my campaign slogan out of you know, context. It's just an Arabic word, meaning uprising. And they redefined it to then serve their own purpose. The redefinition to me was killing of all Jews. Samaya received a barrage of abuse on social media. They called you a frustrated, uh, sexually repressed woman. <laughs> they said you were scum. They wanted to kick you out of the country. How hard was all that to deal with? Yeah, I, I distanced myself from that. I would go out and I would be walking on campus. Everyone would be looking at me. I felt like I needed to hide. It took me three days. I, I didn't sleep. I was just like, what? What's going on? We don't want Santa Claus's name, you know, on our name. They have all sorts of followers, and some of those people are a little crazy. We have people that are saying, like, that person should die. This girl was getting death threats. People are like, she's a terrorist, blah, blah, blah. How involved are they on campus politics then? Like, even they if it's money. They get money, but it's rare that they put their name on something because the leadership that I helped create on that campus is aware that it ruins relationships. At the Israel on Campus Coalition in Washington, Tony discovered that the lobby is deliberately adopting a clandestine approach on campuses. We should stand behind our work, not in front of it. It's not helpful for Stand With Us to say to a, a pro-Israel student, or the Israel Project to say to a pro-Israel student, oh, sure, we'll help you, but put our you have to put our logo on it. We're working like so closely with Stand With Us, and we have such a tight partnership with them today that like it's totally seamless. Tony also discovered that anonymity is a key strand of the campaign against BDS. If one of these terrorists on campus wants to disrupt a pro-Israel lecture or something and like unfurl a banner or whatever else, we're going to investigate them, look into bad stuff they've done. That stuff becomes very useful in the moment. And there are any number of ways to push it out. The only thing is that we do it securely and anonymously. And that's the key. It was a Sunday. I was in the kitchen. My partner was in the living room with my daughter. Came in with her laptop, and she said, you've got to see this. Bill Mullen has been a campaigner for the BDS movement for years. His wife had been sent a link to a website containing a letter addressed to her. This letter purported to be by a former student who said, that she had been sexually harassed by me, and she had found other students at Purdue who had had the same experience, and she was writing this letter to 
tell their story. With the anti-Israel people, what's most effective, what we found, at least in the last year, is you do the opposition research, put up some anonymous website, and then put up targeted Facebook ads. Within a very short time, within about 48 hours, we were able to establish that these multiple sites that we had found attacking me had been taken out almost at the same time and that they were clearly the work of the same people. Every few hours, you drip out a new piece of the opposition research. It's psychological warfare. Drives them crazy. One of the accounts said that in the process of supposedly putting my hand on her, I'd invited her to a Palestine organizational meeting. And I thought, well, that's... You're sort of putting your cards on the table there, whoever you are. We found out that a student at Purdue, who I work with, had also been targeted. A former activist with Students for Justice in Palestine agreed to speak only with her face concealed. It said that I would get drunk and go and have sex with multiple guys, and that's just a huge attack on my character and a massive lie. My parents were very upset. They immediately told me to quit my involvement with SJP. They either shut down or they spend time responding to it and investigating it, which is time they can't spend attacking Israel. That's incredibly effective. The main focus was to attack my reputation and my character, pretty much to mess with me so that I don't want to continue my involvement with SJP. It was really an attempt by people who didn't know us to think, maybe I can destroy this marriage at the very least. Maybe I can cause them horrendous personal suffering. The same letter purporting to be harassment to my wife used the name of our daughter. I think that was the worst moment. I think we thought, these people will do anything. They're capable of doing anything. Could you send me some of these websites? I'd be very curious just to see what they look like. I, could, I couldn't. I couldn't <laughs> you no. couldn't? OK. <laughs> but you know, Canary Mission is a good example. Canary Mission is highly, highly effective to the extent that we monitor the Students for Justice in Palestine and their allies. I remember it was the morning I was getting ready for school. I was about to graduate at this point in a pretty cheery mood, I'd say. I got a Facebook message from one of my friends. She goes, hey, Marcel, I don't mean to freak you out, but I think you should see this. I click on it, and then I see it's a picture of me, and it's my name, and it's a profile about me. When I saw that this was a website dedicated to taking down pro-BDS activists and painting us all as terrorists and anti-Semitic, it was chaos. It was chaos in my mind. What are people going to think when they look at my name on Google? Are they going to think I'm a terrorist? Are they going to think I, I don't like Jewish people? And they're picking out individuals who they think are critical of Israel, and they're smearing them. And they're telling them that what's going to happen here is if you don't cease and desist from acting like this, we, in the end, will do much to destroy your career. A few years later, these individuals are applying for jobs within your company. Canary Mission's promotional video threatens to pass these smears onto prospective employers. To ensure that today's radicals are not tomorrow's employees. It was shattering to me because I had to look for a job. I had to start my life. And now I had this website smearing my name before I even got a chance to really make a name for myself. Somebody did contact my employer and ask for me to be fired based on my pro-Palestine activism. They said that, um, you know, if they continued to employ me, that their values are anti-Semitic. It can be really scary at first. I was mostly harassed via Twitter. They were tweeting me, like, every two or three days. They take screenshots, even way back to my Facebook pictures that don't even look like me anymore. I'm just digging and digging through my, my online presence. They're terrified of Canary Mission, and it's about time. We had always been afraid of ending up on there. It was, like, very personal. 
they see us as such a threat that they have to kind of twist and turn and delve into our personal lives. As if they were trying to scare us into stopping our work. Their Twitter campaign is relentless. Every picture that I post on Facebook, it goes onto one of their websites with every tweet that I put in. Every hashtag I post on Instagram, it goes into one of their files. The research operation is very high tech. When I got here a few years ago, the budget was like $3,000. Today it's like a million and a half or more. Probably it's like two million even at this point. I don't even know, it's, it's huge. It's a massive budget. We've got major political consulting firms on retainer that are here all the time. We have our own opposition researchers. We have a lot of communications capabilities. And what's most interesting about it, I think, is that 90% of the people who pay attention to this space very closely have no idea what we're actually doing, which I like. Caffeinated, I tried it yeah. As he left his meeting at the ICC, Tony reflected on the way Jacob Baim had reacted to his questions about Canary Mission. We do it securely and anonymously, and that's the key. It sounds very similar to like a Canary Mission and that kind of thing, is that, yeah. yeah. Are you guys like in touch with them at all, or is there any kind of, no? No, Canary Mission is totally anonymous. <laughs> yes, yeah, 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 it's hard to, hard to figure out who's behind it. Canary Mission is highly, highly effective um, to the extent that we monitor the Students for Justice in Palestine and their allies. Them, we're doing it back. I mean, not we, but um, this is an anonymous group. We don't know who's behind it. I would ask where they get their money from, because ultimately that tells you where the control is. In part two, we reveal for the first time who set up and finances Canary Mission. He called a group of us to ask us what we thought. I told him actually that was a bad idea, but he did it anyway. And how the pro-Israel lobby uses smears to try to change American law. Investigate us for what? For doing nothing wrong? In part one, how anonymous websites smear supporters of the BDS movement. Use the name of our daughter. They're capable of doing anything. It's psychological warfare. Drives them crazy. I'm not saying hardship, but I, I think it's not serious. Yeah. Our undercover reporter, Tony, is having a coffee with Eric, his boss at the Israel Project. Tony wanted to find out more about Canary Mission. There's a guy named Adam Milstein who you might want to meet. He's a convicted felon. Um, that's a bad way to describe him. He's a real estate mogul. When I was working with him when I was at APAC, I was literally emailing back and forth with him while he was in jail. But he's loaded. I mean, he's close to half a million dollars. Adam Milstein has become a central figure in the lobby. His foundation funds numerous pro-Israel organizations. He also sits on the boards of APAC's National Council, the Israel on Campus Coalition, and Stand With Us. Our reporter filmed him alongside Jacob Baim from the Israel on Campus Coalition at the Stand With Us conference in Los Angeles. The two men had lengthy private discussions. Milstein is close to probably the wealthiest donor to the pro-Israel lobby, Sheldon Adelson. Adelson's money helped Milstein expand the Israeli-American Council into a major new force within the lobby. Adelson arrived at the 2016 IAC conference with Rudy Giuliani, now an advisor to President Trump. An IAC video from the conference shows Milstein and Adelson discussing their partnership. You said you see the vision and you tell us, go and do it. And we took your orders and we made it happen. And we took your money. <laughs> There's somebody else around that can give you 50 million? No, there is no... Shall... Eric is wary of Adelson's relationship with a U.S. president. He's really impulsive. If he gets a call from, you know, Donald Trump, Donald Trump comes to get all the pro organizations to start helping us. He starts putting their arms and putting pressure on them. Like, I give you a million dollars. You better start putting out TV ads. That's not our goal. You know, it's not our mission. 
Tony attended the Israeli-American Council's annual conference. At a party, he spotted the IAC's chairman, Adam Milstein. It's very important that we're proud Jews. We're not, oh, you know, I was born Jews, but I'm really not Jew, and I'm not sure. We're proud Jews. We're proud about our history. We have strong connection to the land of Israel. So this is really a difference now all over the world. I'm yeah? Tony. I'm in the Israel Project with Ari Gallagher. Milstein told Tony how critics of Israel should be handled. First of all, investigate who they are, what's their agenda. They're picking on the Jews because it's easy, because it's popular. We need to expose what they really are. And we need to expose the fact that they have the everything we believe in. And we need to put them on the run. Right now, they can do whatever they like, terrorize us, and we are... How do we put them on the run, though? Doing it by exposing who they are, what they are, the fact that they're racist, the fact that they're big of the big in democracy. Do you think there's a good role to just naming them as anti-Semites? Not just anti-Semites, it's too simple. We need to present them for what they really are. They're anti-freedom, they're anti-Christian, they're anti-democracy. That's what we need to do. Yeah. Numerous groups from the pro-Israel lobby were attending the conference. An Israeli official gave them a message to pass on to BDS supporters in America. Everybody out there who has to do anything with BDS should ask himself twice, do I want to be on this side or do I want to be on the other side? If I'm submitting to BDS, what would be the effect? We've got the budget. We can bring things to the table that are quite different. In episode one of The Lobby USA, Tony discovered that the Israeli government has launched a covert campaign to gather information on American citizens. We have three different sub-campaigns. Data gathering, working on activist organization, money trail. The Israeli official named one organization that was a partner in its covert campaign, the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, or FDD. This is something that only a country with its resources can do the best. We have FDD, we have others working on this. She names the Foundation for the Defense of Democracy as an agent for this foreign government going after American citizens. I mean, that quote is a smoking gun. Yeah. Sorry, are you Jonathan? Hey, I'm Tony. Hi. Hi. I met up with uh, Benny Weinstein. Jonathan Shanza works for the FDD. He produces research on the financing of armed groups. Yeah, I've, I'm very interested in getting involved in, like, BDS activity and stuff like that. Hopefully um, anti-BDS. <laughs> if you had on tape a senior Russian or Iranian or even Canadian official, saying that they were running covert operations to spy on Americans and using an organization like the Foundation for Defense of Democracies as a front group, I think it would be a bombshell. Shanzo was invited to talk at the training workshops that Tony attended. The think tanks are the folks that used to work in government, have PhDs, and decided not to become professors. To call it the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies is a misnomer. It's the Foundation for the Defense of Israel. When you strip away all the layers of the onion and you look at what you really have, what you have is a foundation that is dedicated to one goal and that is defending Israel at every turn. The FDD's mission has been to associate students who support BDS through links to charities and pressure groups, ultimately to Hamas, which governs the besieged territory of Gaza. We found out that there was a coordinator paid to make sure that the activists from a certain group called SJP, Students for Justice in Palestine, who is working with all the different SJP chapters around the country to make sure that they all have the same message. So we said, wait a minute, who are these people? That kind of 
sounds like a little bit like a network. We took a little bit of a deeper dive. We found out that there was one organization that was, in fact, the mothership. Shanza's mothership is a group called American Muslims for Palestine. Here's the remarkable thing, is that this organization has employees that used to work for Hamas charities here in the United States. Many employees, as a matter of fact, that used to work for the Holy Land Foundation. Does that name ring a bell to anyone? The Holy Land Foundation was the largest Islamic charity in the United States. In the aftermath of 9-11, the government accused it of funding terrorism. With this action, we go beyond the Al-Qaeda network to target groups whose violent actions are designed to destroy the Middle East peace process. Hamas emerged as a resistance movement challenging Israel's occupation of Palestinian land. The United States lists it as a foreign terrorist organization. Five members of the Holy Land Foundation were later convicted of sending money to Hamas. Almost 90% of all those Arab and Muslims that were targeted in the United States post 9-11 were targeted because of their engagement with the Palestine issue. They had nothing to do with being members of Al-Qaeda, have no relationship whatsoever to what so-called transnational terrorism. There's been a very strong trend uh, from Israel and its advocates since the September 11, 2001 attacks to portray Israel as part of a civilizational war where Israel is on the Western side and Israel's critics are on the side of the terrorists. According to reports in Israeli newspapers in 2008, Prime Minister Netanyahu said 9-11 had been good for Israel. The attacks had swung American public opinion in its favor. It's not surprising one of the largest cases that we had in this country was the shutting down of the Holy Land Foundation. If you look at all those that were targeted, were targeted in relations to Palestine-Israel uh, conflict and their engagement politically. Turns out there are three individuals currently working for what we'll call mothership that they used to work for the Holy Land Foundation. Three former volunteers at the Holy Land Foundation are now involved with American Muslims for Palestine. None of these individuals has been accused of any wrongdoing in the United States. So I'm thinking, aha, okay, terror financiers. I used to do this for a living. I used to work for the Treasury Department tracking terrorist money. I know these guys. What's going on here? We have no affiliation with any foreign organization. We don't receive money from overseas. And this mothership organization is a very small organization. But the pro-Israel advocacy class heard another message. He was that the primary driver of the BDS movement in America is all populated by people who are former Hamas charity employees. This is not a grassroots organization. This is not a grassroots movement. It is being coordinated by very bad people, and it needs to be made known. Think tanks like the FDD play an important role for Israel in the media. Their selective use of evidence is often presented as legitimate academic research. They try to educate people to understand that Israel is effectively a Western liberal democracy in the sea of terrorist states, which is the Arab world. The other goal is to intimidate and to smear people. Shanzer is invited by pro-Israel congressmen to provide evidence before subcommittees on terrorism in the Middle East. He uses them to insinuate that prominent activists for Palestinian equal rights are linked to armed groups. The AMP's founder and president, Hatem Bazian, was one of two featured speakers at a 2004 fundraising dinner in California. Incidentally, the other speaker at this dinner was Mohammed al mazain who was currently in jail for his role in the Holy Land Foundation and for providing financial support to Hamas. When you enter it into the congressional record, now people are begin, begin to think that there's some legitimacy to it. So this dumping of utter 
nonsense and garbage into the congressional record, into a legitimate hearing, will have a effect down the line. There's also Osama Abu Ershade. He is currently the national coordinator and policy director for AMP. Mr. Abu Ershade also runs a pro-Hamas newspaper in Virginia. They made Palestine as a front on the war on terrorism. It was Al-Qaeda that attacked the United States. It wasn't Hamas or any Palestinian organization. It was Al-Qaeda. I should note here that our open, research, uh, open source research did not indicate that AMP or any of these individuals are currently involved in illegal activity. He himself, in his testimony in Congress, he says, we have no evidence of any wrongdoing by this organization, but still you have to investigate them. So investigate us for what? For doing nothing wrong? The fact it's rubbish does not mean that people don't listen to it, right? Shanza's allegations that American students are somehow connected to armed groups in the Middle East has become part of the lobby's attempt to demonize BDS. Organizations that have spread throughout the world via a network of carefully constructed proxies. We should promote the fact that according to Jonathan Shanza, no terrorism, he said a group of people who were active in funding Hamas have now formed a group of American Muslims for Palestine. Shanzer, a testifying, said they're a leading driver of the BDS campaign. They're the most important sponsor and organizers of SJP. We have to make it clear in every way possible that they are being funded and trained by vicious lovers of Hamas. Hello there. Hi, hi. Hi, everyone. How's it going? Tony spoke again to his contacts at the Algemeiner newspaper. They want him to go undercover at a rally supporting BDS. They want Tony to find a connection between the activists he's supposed to spy on and the Holy Land Foundation. There's a long history of crimes affiliated with the BDS movement that have been judged as such by the US court. For example, the Holy Land Foundation. Are these people still active and present within the movement? Who seems to be the people running the show here, doing the acknowledgement of any sponsors. This is an ancestral business. You know, they're all interconnected. This is not me just spouting off because I'm paranoid. There have been actual cases, like the Holy Land case that happened a few years ago. A lot of these guys had um, worked with those people, and they themselves have not yet been indicted, but they're all interconnected. Part of the reason why that is so crucial is because when you're making lines from one organization to the other, eventually you make a line to Hamas, to Hezbollah, to Iran. Sounds good. Well, we're grateful to have you. Let's, uh, let's see how it goes. While he considered his undercover mission for the Algemeine, Tony set up a meeting with Jonathan Shanza. It was at the office of the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Hey, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. Good, good. to see you. You too. Uh, at you their earlier meeting, Shanza had stressed the importance of links that connected students who support BDS to the Holy Land Foundation and then Hamas. Now he was more downbeat. The lobby is apparently failing in its attempts to discredit the movement. BDS has taken everybody's surprise. It's come up you know, uh, behind everyone's back and bit them on the ass. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a complete mess. Um, I can tell you that I don't think anybody's doing a good job. Um, we're not even doing a good job. We did some good research, but we haven't figured out how to do anything with it. Shanzer is unhappy that his alleged links between Students for Justice in Palestine and Hamas have not been publicized more widely. The stuff that I share with your group, our hope was to really, you know, make this something that people could sink their teeth into, but no one has turned it into, no one's weaponized it, is probably the best way of, of, of describing it. The slurs the lobby once relied on are no longer working. Personally, I think anti-Semitism um, uh, as a smear is not what it used to be. Shanz is now trying to link BDS to a small Palestinian faction that once was involved in militancy, the popular front for the liberation of Palestine. So you got Hamas on one hand, you got PFLP on the other. Sooner or later, this stuff will come to light. 
What have you found so far? We'll come out with something when I've got enough. We found indications that there could be some research to produce. Their strategy is to fill the pipeline of as much research and information that creates what I consider it to be is the civil society assassination of Arab Muslim Palestinians in such a way that they will not have an entry into the debate. Shanza claims he's found yet another means of discrediting the BDS movement, this time connecting it to the Muslim Brotherhood. The problem is the Muslim Brotherhood is not an illegal organization in the United States. So you can say that that's bad, but there's, if there's no legal link, there's no, um, you know, um, there's no law enforcement angle on any level, then it becomes really hard to win. The Muslim Brotherhood is a loose international movement which endorses the political expression of Islamic values. Congress is now considering designating it as a terrorist organization. They are moving right now with a bill to try to ban the Muslim Brotherhood movement. So the strategy that is being deployed, which is create the demonization, filling the garbage can with as much material as possible, especially from a Congress and Senate. We've been dealing with the radical Islam from the Islamic Republic since 1979, okay. Okay. the Muslim okay. Brotherhood since the 1920s. You've got the Islamic State, you've got the Islamic Republic. Their hatred for Israel, their Islamist ideology is what is what really motivates the terrorism that they carry out. You have to attack their weaknesses better than they attack your weaknesses. That's war. Why they're doing this? Why they're going after our organizations? It's always connected to the issue of Palestine. They always try to connect us, to connect dots that they don't exist. Terrorism is a very effective word. And what a lot of people in the lobby try to do is describe pro-Arab or pro-Palestinian groups as terrorist groups. There's no doubt that when you employ the tactic of identifying Muslim or Arab or Palestinian groups as terrorist organizations that you're promoting Islamophobia. Shanza is a popular speaker at the pro-Israel campus events that Tony attends. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> Welcome. A panel discussion at George Mason University is an opportunity to promote the FDD's research to a friendly audience. My organization, FDD, earlier this year concluded a deep dive study into the fiscal and corporate sponsors of BDS, and we found several troubling connections to the Palestinian terrorist group Hamas an Islamist supremacist organization that seeks nothing less than the annihilation of the state of Israel. I recently published research just this week showing that BDS, uh, get, uh, BDS groups get help from other uh, Palestinian terrorist organizations like the Popular Front for Liberation of Palestine. The problem is that most students don't know who is behind BDS and most Americans don't know. And this is why BDS is gaining traction. AMP is the de facto national leadership of Students for Justice in Palestine. There is an actual direct connection between the people who are involved in raising money for Hamas and the people who are involved in BDS activism on American campuses today. Pollock claims that SJP is just a front to hide the real agenda of American Muslims for Palestine. You'll notice their name is Students for Justice in Palestine. You don't hear the word Islamic, you don't hear the word Muslim in, in that name, and you hear the word justice which is kind of a buzzword on campuses today. Everyone's for justice, right? You're not for injustice. The crowd that's kind of behind the scenes is actually a very Islamic radical cause. And if you actually get like into the weeds on SJP, they've aligned with groups that are for the, not just the destruction of Israel, the destruction of America. That's a narrative that suits Israel because it takes the pressure off Israel to actually end what it's doing to Palestinians but it's an incredibly dangerous narrative for the whole world, and I think we're all paying the price of it. Pollock even accuses Jewish supporters of BDS of being in league with Hamas. Jewish voice for peace, or as I call it, Jewish voice for Hamas. Um, they, it'd be like having a group called, like, you know, African Americans for slavery. You know, it's like, it's crazy, right? A lot of the JVP people um, 
are not um, not Jewish. Um, they've had a, a real problem of like people basically pretending to be Jews because the anti-Israel activism sound it's a little more sexy. You're here. You're here, to, you're here speaking. Uh, speaking with the rabbi. I, I, I work for for Jewish Voice for Peace. Uh, I mean, we're 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 a Jewish organization. I mean, again, I think that's another kind of a absurd absurd claim. When you talk about SJP and when you talk about BDS, you talk about them as a hate group, um, as a, as a movement that absolutely endorses violence against civilians, not military conflict, but violence against civilians, AKA terrorism. You discredit the messenger as a way of discrediting the message. Tony's boss, Eric, was also at the event. He's old friends with Noah Pollock. I want to hire Tony at the Israel press. Tony's uh, another troublemaker from the UK. Yeah. Uh, this good guy knows the best. As Tony left the event with Eric, the conversation turned to smearing BDS supporters. Eric said wealthy pro-Israel donors now have the freedom to fight Israel's critics however they want. In this country, you have these billionaire types who are starting to realize, like, oh, wow, I could build my... I don't need to participate in the Republican or Democratic parties. I could build my own apparatus and have influence from Los Angeles or Detroit. And Adam Milstein is one of those guys. And he funds, he funds the Israel Project. He does a lot of great work. Eric then made a remarkable claim when Tony asked about Canary Mission. Who are the people involved with them? It's him. It's him. Adam Milstein. Yeah, I don't know who he hired to oversee it. Adam Milstein. Yeah. He's the guy who funds it. We need to expose the fact that they're at the everything we believe in. We need to put them on the run. It's Adam Milstein, he funds the Israel Project, and he's funding the Canary Mission website. Yeah, which is, which is interesting because it, it makes it seem as though we're a part of it, but we're not. Yeah. Actually, I was involved with the effort to start with the name and shame. He called a group of us to ask us what we thought. I told him actually I thought it was a bad idea, but he did it anyway. They've lost the political argument. They can now do nothing but resort to personal smears against us. They can't engage us in discussions of the occupation. They can't defend apartheid. They can't defend the bombings in Gaza, but they can try to destroy our lives. Kind of really desperate and pathetic almost, you know, going after students, um, trying to compromise their futures because they're trying to fight for social justice. I know a guy actually is working with Adam on all sorts of digital spying. There's a, a group of like anonymous people who are, have a very sophisticated digital strategy for exposing these people and making sure that stuff stays with them. Yeah. There's no one on their side doing it, so you don't have to worry about your reputation. In episode four, how the pro-Israel lobby is fighting the public relations war. The activism has been like very divided and potentially getting just like a total like no given. And how the Israel project is laying the ground for a future conflict with Hezbollah. We have to be ready because that, that war will be one of the lost, you know, the court of public opinion and not the battlefield. Previously on The Lobby USA, Noah Pollock from the Emergency Committee for Israel tells supporters how to describe the BDS movement. When you talk about BDS, you talk about them as a movement that absolutely endorses violence against civilians, AKA terrorism. Why they're doing this? They always try to connect us, to connect dots that they don't exist. In the final episode of The Lobby USA, a look ahead. After half a century of Israeli occupation, hopes that a peace deal could create two states in the lands of historic Palestine are fading fast. So how will the lobby respond? Our man on the inside finds out. Using an undercover reporter, Al Jazeera's investigative unit infiltrates one of the most powerful lobbies in the world. Getting $38 billion in security agents about matters, which is what APAC is doing. We examine how the lobby, led by APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, has secured unwavering support in Congress. Congressmen don't do anything unless you pressure them. And the only way to do that is with money. 
What the lobby is all about is to make sure that Israel gets special treatment from the United States forever. But after occupying Palestinian lands for half a century, the pro-Israel lobby is facing a new challenge. We called for a full boycott of Israel, divesting from it and eventually imposing sanctions on it to achieve UN stipulated rights of the Palestinian people. A movement to boycott, divest and impose sanctions on Israel, BDS, was formed on American campuses. It seems to be achieving its goals. It threatens future American support for Israel. We believe in justice for all people. So that means the occupation has to end. Israel's Ministry of Strategic Affairs responded with a covert operation to defeat BDS. The Israeli government leverages Jewish organizations yes. in the diaspora. Absolutely. It's a psychological campaign involving spying and smears. You discredit the messenger as a way of discrediting the message. Just stay on message. And what is that message? BDS is a hate movement. While our reporter monitored pro-Israel groups, he was asked to go undercover for the lobby. You're going into enemy territory, not for everybody. Our undercover reporter was attending a dinner at the annual conference of the Israeli-American Council in Washington. He met an American involved in the Israeli government's anti-BDS campaign. In my job, I get to work with every major news network, and I don't even work in media. I don't have to have a course. Every university president takes our calls, takes our meetings, takes our There's a legitimate government organization. The discussion was dominated by the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. The three-day conference brings together the constellation of pro-Israel lobby groups in the U.S. On the surface, things seem to be looking good for Israel. Israel's booming. It's the startup nation. More venture capital is going into Israel today than at any other time in history. So why don't we just calm down, realize that BDS is worthless, it's losing, and ignore it. I don't think BDS was ever supposed to be about getting colleges to take their money out of Israel. So if we focus on the dollars, we could feel really good about ourselves. If we focus on the fact that an effort's being made to distance us, those who love Israel, Israel, from the rising generation, I think we need to worry. When you get to the millennials and the students, it's a bad situation. And, and it's getting to the point now where the majority is more favorable towards the Palestinians than the Israelis. While numerous speakers discussed ways to combat BDS, the lack of civil rights for Palestinians living under Israeli control was not raised. Nobody talks about the reason why BDS exists at all. What's the model for the BDS movement? The model is South Africa. So was that a bad thing to do? An apartheid regime which denied equal rights to black South Africans was weakened and ultimately collapsed after a global economic and political boycott. They're worried that the BDS movement will get to the stature that the South Africa boycott got to. So they're trying to stop it now. Imagine if the apartheid regime of the clerk were able to have a lobby in America that it was a crime to support the, that, that boycott. Imagine that. For nearly two decades, Israel's occupation was portrayed as temporary, while both sides pursued what's called a two-state solution. 
the two-state solution. This is where the Palestinians get a state of their own in the occupied territories, i.e. the West Bank and Gaza. But there's a problem. Jewish-only settlements have continued to grow within the boundary of a proposed Palestinian state. Successive US governments have openly doubted whether a viable Palestinian nation is either possible or necessary. The settler agenda is defining the future of Israel. And their stated purpose is clear. They believe in one state, Greater Israel. In fact, one prominent minister declared just after the US election, and I quote, the era of the two-state solution is over. I'm looking at two state and one state, and I like the one that both parties like. I'm very happy with the one that both parties like. I can live with either one. If the choice is one state, Israel can either be Jewish or democratic. It cannot be both. More and more people are beginning to buy into the argument that Israel is turning itself into an apartheid state. It used to be the case that the word apartheid was never used with Israel. In order to discredit the apartheid label, the lobby has launched a campaign to try to co-opt black South Africans. Black South Africans who were apartheid activists, who were brought to Israel, saw the reality, came home angry at BDS. They felt lied to. They felt that there, someone had tried to steal their narrative. This is an effective tool bringing these black South African former BDS activists, now Israel supporters, to American campuses. During his volunteership, Tony learned that the Israel Project has been developing a strategy called Stop Stealing My Apartheid. The plan is to feed articles written by black South Africans into the American media, claiming that BDS has distorted their history. If you're disgusted by desegregation in this country, if you're disgusted by South African apartheid, then you should also be disgusted by Israeli apartheid. Another workshop was addressed by Israeli diplomats from consulates in the US. Black Lives Matter had attracted particular criticism after voicing support for the BDS movement. It appears that Israel's diplomats may be trying to challenge the apartheid label by canvassing support amongst African Americans. The major problem of Israel is with the young generation of the black community. Black Lives Matter starts there. I had last week a dinner, sit-down dinner at my house for 40 people, which are considered the leadership of the black community. And it's very important people. They can be part of our uh, doing an activity. Pro-Israel groups are trying to cultivate a new generation of black leaders that is pro-Israel by bringing them to APEC conferences on all expenses paid trips, by taking them on delegations to Israel. They're doing that because they're afraid of BDS and they're afraid of Black Lives Matter, which is this new struggle for black freedom that also sees black freedom as situated in a, in a larger context. In 2014, Israel launched the siege of Gaza. In the same summer, police in Ferguson killed Mike Brown, and Ferguson rose up. And on the news at night, there would be both the latest out of Gaza and the latest out of Ferguson. There was solidarity that was expressed online with the Ferguson uprising. There were Palestinians who took to Twitter to cheer on the rebels of Ferguson and explain how to deal with tear gas. Israel's diplomats have responded by evoking the legacy of Martin Luther King, claiming that the campaign for Palestinian civil rights bears no resemblance to the civil rights movement in America. 
Dr. Clarence B. Jones, who wrote the draft speech for Martin Luther King, I Have a Dream. He was his lawyer, he was his close friend. He's somebody that I reached out to. He became a very close and personal friend. Because of that relationship, he published three articles in the Huffington Post explaining why their agenda was hijacked. Martin Luther King will turn in his grave if he saw the anti-Israel tendencies or policies that are starting to emerge in Black Lives Matter. There's something on one hand laughable about it, but there's something also really insidious about this. You're using the credibility of a freedom struggle to try to oppose another freedom struggle. And I think that that's appalling. Soon after Black Lives Matter declared support for BDS, a fundraiser at a New York nightclub was suddenly canceled. The venue's management said it didn't approve of the movement's stance on Israel. Tony was told by his boss, Eric, that the Israel project was behind the decision. I don't know if you saw, but uh, this club, you know, ditched a Black Lives Matter event. One of our daughters, we just put a call to him and then we put in the call to the police. Well, to shut down this Black Lives Matter event. I think it's really appalling that a system in Israel has devised incredible and comprehensive ways to have a violent regime against Palestinians, that they would also invest resources into making sure to shore up support for that oppression here. One evening at the IAC conference, Tony met a prominent activist. He's associated with the hardline trend in the pro-Israel lobby. Noah Pollock argues that tough tactics are needed to counter the apartheid label. The activism has to be like very provocative and like attention getting and just like a total like no given. Like we're going to be more pro-Israel than you can even imagine. Just to like provoke everyone. Pollock believes the American public, unlike those in Britain, will accept his gloves off strategy. The majority of payment is that Americans are pro Israel. Whereas if you never pull Israel in the UK, it's just pure hatred. Your country like basically let half of Pakistan do it. You know? So you have a different problem than we do here. Tony was told of a demonstration that Noah Pollock was organizing. A bus took protesters to an event organized by the pro-BDS movement, Students for Justice in Palestine. Hey, man. I'm Tony. Marshall. Nice yes. to meet you. This is one of those things where either it's going to be amazing and we're going to defeat BDS, or we're just broken. But you can't beat them, join them. I'm obsessed with winning, you know, so I just want to win. So yeah, I want to win something. You don't win anymore. The protesters are on a fellowship program run by a conservative think tank called the Hoover Institution. The whole fellowship is scrappy. It's like, you guys are like foot soldiers and conservative movement. This is actually the first foot soldier activity that I think it's been important to do. Tony, what's your connection to the conspiracy that we're all part of? Yeah, the Israel Project. So you can't uh... not come. Their plan is to disrupt the National Conference of Students for Justice in Palestine. Marshall said that the pro-Israel protest had been poorly planned. It's a very fly-by-the-pants procedure. Yeah. There's basically just like Noah Paula coming in the like, look, there are these jihadis who basically yeah. support suicide bombing, and they're at a campus, and you have to stop them. So a chance to shout at Arabs? As we're leaving, we mentioned to our boss yesterday that we're going. She's like, oh, yeah, that's mandatory. You need to go. While they've been told they have to take part in the protest, not everyone on the bus is convinced it's good for their reputation. Do you know what my worst nightmare is? I'm actually not kidding. It's a photo of Dion and I together. And we're just like clearly identifiable. And they're like, oh, we're these like traitors who sold out to the Jewish conspiracy for money. And I'm like, we did. We cost $50,000 plus benefits. As the bus leaves, they discuss whether there's any point in staging the protest. I'm just skeptical. 
of using the protesting tactic against them? Well, that's not, that's not our demographic. They don't. Like, the reason protests work is when, like, the people involved really care about it and, like, want to be there. But then no, what are we supposed to do? Because they, they keep existing and they keep expanding. And no matter how many lawmakers come out against BDS, they keep growing. Well, no, you're right. Like, we should do something. But at the end of the day, like, the notion that the right is ever going to dominate any sort of campus protest is ridiculous. You can't just let them. Well, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying and that. And that's if, what happened. If I were a high-level Jewish dealer, I would be, like, a little more realistic about the expectations. So what would you do if you were a high-level Jewish dealer? I continue to do what, what, what you're doing, which is focusing on the actual power structures that power structures in it themselves. Like, the reality is there's not a single college president in this country that would actually sign BDS. There is not a but single... they all allow SGP to exist in their campus. Because it's free speech. They cannot right. let them. So what are they supposed to do about it? When a protest is sponsored and organized by outsiders, but made to appear like a popular grassroots movement, it's known as astroturfing. So they did a really job of getting me excited to show up and protest. It's kind of, it kind of, the way you're putting it kind of sounds a bit like astroturfing. No, 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 this is astroturfing. No, this <laughs> is literally actually, the definition. There's a bus. What does that mean? So it's when you set up things. It's the difference between astroturf. grassroots and oh. astroturf. You're taking corporate money and you're manufacturing the image of a grassroots movement with corporate money by basically paying people to appear as activists. It just shows how little actual grassroots power they have and how all of their power is at the top. It's not that astroturfing is wrong, it's just that like, your astroturf has to be like committed. We shouldn't have fellows saying, like, honestly, this is bad for my political career. The bus arrives at George Mason University, where Students for Justice in Palestine is holding its national conference. But the protesters can't find the conference hall. They just pull over and ask, hey, where are all the jihadis? The driver sees two students and stops to ask directions. One is wearing a headscarf. Wait. Oh, no. Come on. What? Oh, We're like, back to D.C. Back to D.C. I believe the comment said. <laughs> oh, okay. No, no, no. Um, excuse me? Do you know where the Johnson Center is? Uh, okay, just so like just go back. back down this. Okay. Okay, thank you. That was problematic. <laughs> so this is off to a good start. <laughs> Students for Justice in Palestine really is a student-led type of organization focused around promoting the BDS cause. We have workshops on how to run our divestment campaign, finding intersections on campus, building alliances. Right now, Palestine has been essentially normalized on campuses. The bus finally arrives. Noah Pollock's protest is not a student event. To avoid breaking university regulations, he's arranged a legal briefing. The SGP conference is on the third floor, and we're going to go up and, in a respectful and quiet way, um, protest them. Gail uh, is a legal expert, and he's going to talk a little bit about that. We are here, of course, as guests of the university. So um, we don't want to be accused of disrupting a school-sponsored activity. It is against the law to use abusive or violent language. So we're going to use peaceful, good language. If we see that they're doing anything that is bad behavior, don't engage, remain calm. If you do happen to speak with any reporters, just stay on message. And what is that message? SJP is a hate group. Hate group. BDS is a hate movement. The only other thing you probably want to mention is that SJP endorses violence, terrorism, things like that. And you guys are going to be great. We're not there to provoke. We're not there to have any sort of incident at all. We're nice people. Tony's group of protesters then faced another obstacle. Wow, my, I don't know if you guys heard they were stuck in an elevator. Yeah, I really like the idea. Yeah. With all the signs. They were shut us in an elevator. They had someone on the inside. That's anti-Semites. 
we start seeing groups of people coming towards us who don't seem familiar, and then brandishing Israel flags and then posters and signs. Freed from the elevator, Tony joined the demonstration. No, no. Support democratic society. But if you don't want to, we denounce extremist groups. What do you think of this? You agree? Resistance? Child suicide bombers? How do you respond to such a wild accusation that's not grounded in anything and that's just designed to, to shift attention? Oh, wait, we support suicide bombers. You, that's ridiculous. Uh, Before that, social justice left supports radical terrorists. You don't want dialogue? We're here to talk to you. you turn your back. You'd think if like, they were going to do it, they'd try to shake it up and mix it up with new accusations. We don't support radical Islamic terrorism in this country. We don't support suicide bombers. Cowards who kill children and women. They leave orphans. We don't support that. Kill babies in strollers. That'll bring peace. Yeah, Palestinian terrorists all over Israel. That would be it. <laughs> Real baby killers, these terrorists. They yeah. kill women, they kill children, they don't care about anything. Great women do all the time. It takes a lot to hear this and not respond, and to turn your back to them, and to not look back at them. Thank you, SJP. Good luck with your jihad. They were very frustrated, the fact that we weren't responding. They're saying, they're not even responding. They're not even responding. Yeah, Look at how they wave the Palestinian flag at our country. Look at this. Despicable. Exactly. These are the real basket of deplorables. These are the deplorables, people. They cower behind radical Islamism. They don't engage in dialogue because they can't win the war of ideas. There's no responding to our content, because there is no refuting our content. Our content is grounded in human rights, morality, ethics, international law. The staged protest had minimal impact on the students at George Mason University. But the headlines shared on social media tell the story Pollock wanted. Let's uh, head back to headquarters for uh, debriefing and cocktails. In part two, a looming crisis for the lobby. APAC is not representative of the American Jewish community. There used to be actually widespread public support for Israel in the United States. The foundation that APAC sat on is, is rotting. In part one, how support for Israel is falling amongst the young. It's a bad situation. The majority is more favorable towards the Palestinians than the Israelis. Child suicide bombers. And the lobby support on campus isn't always what it seems. Or were these like traitors who sold out to the Jewish conspiracy for money? I'm like, we did. We cost $50,000 plus benefits. Tony went to see his boss at the Israel Project, which is known as TIP, for brunch. Eric told him why Jerusalem is a favorite hub for journalists covering the Middle East. One of the reasons why Israel's covered disproportionately is the overwhelming majority of journalists covering the Middle East are based in Jerusalem. Tip is laying the groundwork in the media for a future war between Israel and Hezbollah. We're preparing for the worst case scenario. If it happens, we have to be ready because that, that war will be one that lost you know, the court of public opinion, not the battlefield. Journalists based in Jerusalem would likely cover that war. The Israel Project has an office there. We have an enormous interest in affecting the people around the ground there. And that's what they do. They build relationships with people who can give them information that they can then feed to journalists who are building relationships with. And so the lures are staff of about probably 20 people. Yeah. 
He was chief of staff of the Israeli embassy in DC for many years. Um, he's a veteran of Israeli politics, but he was like spokesman for a bunch of government ministries. And so he's got a real expertise in dealing with the press. He's an expert at making the jobs easier. So, for instance, we actually now, when there's a terror attack in Israel, our staff gets to the scene usually before the press does. Just because they are so good. They, they still have their vests on and cameras, and as soon as there's a Twitter an attack, we have like four guys at the scene. Breaking news overseas, a shooting in the heart of Tel Aviv. He has this rapid response team where he has people strategically placed around the country. So if there's an attack, like the Sorona attack at Sorona Market in Tel Aviv. Clearly an attack on a soft target right now based on all the initial uh, preliminary details we're getting from this very fast developing story. They take pictures and they get testimonies. By the time the press gets there, we do their jobs well. They, they need, you know, they need quote, they need information, they need a picture or video clip and full service, you know, shot. We just give them. This is new video that just came in and it shows people in the chaos after this happened as it is night in Tel Aviv. By the time the press got there, we were able to help with the narrative because, you know, they're all scrambling, you know, they, they need to get this stuff to their editors immediately on what happened back in Brussels or Washington and you know, we were able to get them information. A tip employee was interviewed by Fox News. Liat Delongovitz, who is live with us on the scene, works for the Israeli project, which puts out news to the foreign press there. Hi, I'm here on the scene. I arrived fairly early. They use children to protect. The former CNN correspondent, Jim Clancy, first reported on the Middle East in the early 1980s. Those boundaries. When Chip begins interacting with journalists and suggesting the lines and suggesting the interviews, then it's not journalism anymore, it's just propaganda. Liat Delongovitz, who is on scene, again, works for the Israel Project, which works to put news out to the foreign press. During his volunteership at the Israel Project, Tony saw a letter to a donut explaining how Tip had assisted a journalist from CNN. Tip took Will Ripley on a helicopter tour, which seemingly impressed the reporter. Once you arrive in Israel, they come up with a series of things. They know you're in town. They have your number. You get the helicopter tour. That's fun. You get some video that you can use in your reporting. And then they sponsor trips like this one with special access to people that uh, they know, and they can set it up. I visited the Israeli side of the border with Gaza and can tell you the tension there is palpable. Hamas leaders have stated that they are aggressively expanding their underground labyrinth of tunnels. This won't help. The safe room won't protect you from Not a tunnel from attack. That. Not from that. It's a very compelling report, but it's based on an absolute lie. And there are even reports from some residents they are hearing digging underground. The premise of the report is that Palestinians are digging tunnels in order to come up into the bedrooms of Israeli children and to kidnap them or kill them or terrorize them. The document Tony saw claimed the tip's influence created one of the fairest reports on Israel shown recently on a major broadcaster. For those living close to Gaza, it seems only a matter of time before it happens again. It keeps me awake at night. There isn't one recorded case of these tunnels being used to attack Israeli civilians. The report was presented solely from one side. The Israel Defense Forces say the average Hamas tunnel is three kilometers, nearly two miles, costing millions of dollars and tons of valuable concrete, resources badly needed by the long-suffering people of Gaza to rebuild their cities. Tip fully knows that if you're the journalist in Gaza who's doing a report with Hamas sources, your office is damn well going to require that you put in an Israeli voice to counter some of the things that are said there. They well know that if you are on the Israeli side doing a report with mostly Israeli sources, that same pressure will not be applied. You will be allowed to go ahead without trying to get the other side of the story. Why is that? That's because TIP is powerful, and they're going to hold journalists to account. Dedicated to changing people's minds. TIP's promotional video explains its role. We don't attack the media. We become a trusted partner and resource, bringing integrity and facts to the coverage. After an exchange of tweets concerning the Charlie Hebdo attacks in 2015, Clancy left CNN. 
he is unable to discuss his departure for legal reasons, but recalled instances when the pro-Israeli lobby exerted influence. The big media companies will tell you that, well, maybe they won't tell you this, but they have been harassed. If they had Palestinian journalists who knew the ins and outs of the Palestinian Authority, for example, they were blatantly told to get rid of them, that they weren't trustworthy journalists. Whatever a journalist reports, if it's not liked by whether it's TIP or people within the government, they will put pressure on the media houses, uh, the big networks. TIP's online promotion claims it shapes the way Israel is framed in the international media. TIP changes the way thousands of media reports appear every year. And then we add platforms of our own, getting people talking, taking command of the conversation. This last week, but you know, when I was there, I met with both Herzog and Netanyahu. We exist to kind of articulate the reasons that the notion of a Jewish state is a good thing for us as Americans, and it's a good thing for Jews, and a good thing for Israel, and a good thing for, 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 the, for the West, and a good thing for everybody. Bloch describes the pro-Israel lobby as a three-legged stool, propped up by influencing Congress, shaping policy through think tanks, and thirdly, TIP's role, managing the public discourse. You've got the, the lobbying, the politics, and you've got the ideas and think tanks, but you can't define the meaning of those ideas. Other people are doing it for you, then the third leg of the stool is there and it falls over. He's brilliant in like a mad scientist sort of way. He was Apex spokesman. Yeah. And uh, he was like the troublemaker. You know, he's always breaking the rules, but always getting done. He's very effective at, at strategic communications and dealing with journalists. At APAC, he was the man. I mean, he could get anything on the front page of the Washington Post. The most effective thing you can do in Washington is both explain your point of view and explain why other people disagree with it. Everybody knows that people come with perspectives, you know, reporters and people, you know, we live in a sophisticated world. But the question is, are you credible? The Israel Project gained notoriety in 2009 after an internal policy document was leaked. It was a phrase book for pro-Israel advocates. Key phrases, words that work, were determined from focus groups. Israel wants peace. I want peace. We want to move forward in peace. We want to start negotiations immediately. The Israeli Defense Forces acted against the launching of rockets by terrorists. Our shooting at our children, at our mothers, at our civilians, what for? Stuff is data driven. We do a lot of polling every month. We do a national poll exactly looking for these kinds of messages that work. We know that people get to use most of these headlines. So the headlines are very, very carefully messaged. If all Palestinians can be referred to as terrorist, as in a terrorist attack, they've won a battle. They've won a battle because that headline will be seen by probably 50 times more people than those who actually went into the article and read the details about it. You know what I look for? It's just the three people who turn out uh, carefully crafted headlines with article text that convinces you that the headline is true. they understand that it's just the five-word headline or the six-word headline that carries the message. The point is never to get to the real debate. Why is Iran so happy about the Iran nuclear deal? Tip's social media videos had apparently shifted public opinion on the Iran nuclear deal. The American public started out being in favor of the deal and is now against the deal. There was everything from viral videos you know, 10 second videos. You can send me the greatest article you want about the Iran deal, but I promise you that a 10 second video will get a thousand times. People aren't reading as much, they're not interested. In fact, history's a little bit bunk. 
you know, a lot of people kind of come up now and there's this notion of postmodernism and nothing is true anymore. We are at this sort of interesting moment in time where we need to understand what it is that affects people's understanding and perceptions about what's right and what's wrong and how they work. This visual stimulus and stuff, you know, how are people learning things? During his volunteership, Tony read an annual report to TIP's board of directors. It lauded their social media coverage of the 2016 shooting at Serona Market in Tel Aviv. It said TIP's video was the most watched online content about the attack. The video claimed to show Palestinians celebrating the killing of Israelis, something the mainstream media overlooked. But this was not true. This image was taken in Ramallah two years earlier. There are also other things that we do that are completely off the radar. And we work together with a lot of other organizations. We produce content that they then publish with their own name on it. The Israel Project is supplying what it calls white label, that is unbranded content, to other outlets. We're putting together a lot of pro-Israel media um, through various social media channels that aren't the Israel Project's channel. So we have a lot of side projects who are trying to influence the public debate with. So that's why it's a secretive thing, because we don't want people to know that these side projects are associated with the Israel Project. TIP runs a collection of Facebook communities that cover topics ranging from history and the environment to current affairs and feminism. But their affiliations to the Israel Project are deliberately vague. Why is it that they can't be connected to the Israel Project? I think it's because, like, we want to be people to view them as subjectively as possible. We have a team of like 13 people, and we're working on a lot of like videos, explainers. A lot of it is just random topics, and then maybe like 25% of it would be like Israel or Jewish things. The Israel brand is increasingly toxic. So you can't sell Israel directly. You have to have sort of other hip stuff that's just very innocuous, fun. And then from time to time, you're going to slip something about Israel in. Is the idea that all the rest of the non-Israel stuff is to allow the Israel stuff to pass better? Like, that's the key thing? Um, just that we want to, like, blend in everything. Tip's mission is to eliminate any mention of apartheid and occupation. Don't look here, look over here. The visual medium is trumping words. The more image, more visual, more you know, accessible, mm. non-heavy thinking stuff. Kittens are easy to sell. Apartheid is a much harder product to get people to buy. More and more people will use the word apartheid when they talk about Israel. The end result is that the lobby has to work extremely hard today and will have to work even harder over time to defend Israel. And of course, in part, this means doing everything that can be done here in the United States and in the West more generally to discredit the BDS movement, because the BDS movement is so dangerous to Israel. Tony had gathered that the lobby's concern with BDS was not its economic impact, but a much wider threat to the power of the pro-Israel lobby. The specific potential of an immediate boycott, that's not a problem. 
It's a bigger problem is the Democratic Party, the Bernie Sanders people, bringing all these anti-Israel people in the Democratic Party. Being pro-Israel is less of a bipartisan issue. And then every time the White House changes, policies towards Israel change. And that becomes a dangerous thing for Israel. There is an actually important battle being fought on the campus. For half a century, bipartisanship has been the cornerstone of APAC's success, as its website video explains. By some measures, Democrats and Republicans are more divided today than at any other time in the last two decades. But America's support for Israel transcends partisan politics. So when it comes to strengthening America's relationship with Israel, support must come from both sides of the aisle. That's where APAC comes in. What's begun to happen over the past decade is that support for Israel has begun to wither away in the Democratic Party. And in contrast, support for Israel in the Republican Party has begun to increase. And what you see is there is a substantial difference today in support for Israel in the two parties. APAC has moved so far to the right that it's losing the young people. By the time of the next presidential election, Democrats will not glibly, in a debate, say they're running for president, and I love Israel, and I'm a die-hard supporter of Israel. The terrain has changed dramatically. If you look at the changing demographics in the United States and what people's views are towards Israel and Israel's policies, it's only a matter of time before that trickles up to elected officials. I think it's inevitable. The kind of shift they fear is the one that happened over same-sex marriage. You know, it was only a short few years ago that high majorities in the United States were opposed to same-sex marriage. That change happened within the space of a decade. The Israel lobby will look at something like that and say it wouldn't take much for that kind of historic sea change to happen with respect for US support for Israel. Outside APAC's 2017 annual conference, the first protesters were American Jews. APAC is facing a challenge from the constituency whose views it was formed to represent. APAC does not represent the American Jewish community. A majority of American Jews are opposed to the policies of the state of Israel. One of the groups involved was Jewish Voice for Peace. The work that Jewish Voice for Peace does is grounded in Jewish tradition, the most basic Jewish and human values that every single person has inherent uh, worth and dignity and should be treated with respect. We then see what's happening to Palestinians, the occupation, the displacement, the inequality, and say, we need to end those things. Or that they must attend. You know, there are crazy that we suppose I can say American Jews had one job, which was to preserve Jewish identity from one generation to the next. They failed. So I don't think they have any place to be telling Israel what's what. And if they choose to stop giving money to Israel, Israel will fight money elsewhere. there were few pro-Israel demonstrators. Most wanted to project their strength through Israel's relationship with the United States. The Jewish Defense League, with its distinctive yellow insignias, was a small but threatening presence. Its members later attacked a Palestinian-American man. The 
produce all sorts of survey data for American Jews under the age of 30. Only 32% said that a close attachment to Israel was uh, important to them in terms of what it meant to be Jewish. The more and more young American Jews become aware of what the Israelis are doing to the Palestinians and how indefensible that is, at least in terms of Western values, the more difficult it will be to get those younger American Jews to feel a deep commitment to the state of Israel. I can't breathe! I can't go back. American Jews are even taking their protest to Jerusalem. The Israeli government official who launched a covert campaign to spy on American citizens, recognizes that Israel is facing a generational time bomb. During Tony's volunteership at TIP, his supervisor, Eric, said he's looking to a future when the pro-Israel lobby will be unable to rely on APAC's influence in Congress. He said they faced a major challenge and a big bowling ball was being hurled towards them. They needed to get on the bowling ball and start dancing. You can prove that APAC is suffering from uh, some of the trends that, in public opinion that are affecting the Democratic Party. APAC's uh, it's slipping very, very quickly among Democrats. They're not going to be able to maintain the bipartisan support. So I always say that the foundation that APAC sat on is, is rotting. And that's, there used to be actually widespread public support for Israel in the United States. Um, and so I, I don't think that APAC is going to remain as influential as it is. I don't think APAC's a different sphere anymore, which is worrisome because look who is. No, I have total faith in you. I don't think, I hope it's not the last time we work together. Full disclosure, I wanted, uh, I would love it if you came to work for me. I need someone who is like a, a team player, hardworking, excited, passionate, curious, well-rounded, well-spoken, well-written. You're all of us. Like